This summer, the western regions of the United States have been battling hundreds of wildfires. Earlier this month, a House Resources Subcommittee held a hearing to focus on lessons learned from these fires. Witnesses, including New Mexico Governor Gary Johnson, discussed what is being done and what should be done to reduce the threat of future fires. This four-and-a-half-hour hearing was held in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The oversight, can you hear me? Are the mics on? The oversight hearing uh, um, by the subcommittee on forests and forest health will come to order. Uh, the, the subcommittee is meeting here today to hear testimony on preventing wildfires through the proper management of the national forest. And I want to thank the, uh, the mayor of uh, Albuquerque, Mr. Jim Baca, for uh, his great hospitality and uh, assistance in putting this hearing on. These are no small endeavors to, to bring to the field, and that, and having field hearings is something that uh, we began initiating in uh, 1995 to bring the Congress to the people, because it's very, very difficult and very costly for uh, people to have to leave their work and, and spend the uh, money that it takes to get back to Washington, D.C. So I want to thank all of you for joining us um, today on this very important hearing. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on preventing wildfires through proper management of the national forest. Now, under Rule 4G of the committee rules, any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the chairman and the ranking minority members. Um, this will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner and uh, help members keep to their schedules. Although I do want to say in this case, I am going to recognize all of the members um, on this panel for their opening statements. And I ask unanimous consent that Representatives uh, Wilson and Skeen have permission to sit uh, without objections so ordered. I welcome all of you here today to this very important hearing. Unfortunately, we will only have time to hear testimony from those witnesses who are on the agenda today. However, I also want to hear from those of you who would like to comment. Um, your comments are exceedingly important to, to us, but in order to do this, uh, I want you to know that I will accept your testimony, your written comments, uh, and they will become a part of the official hearing record, the, the official congressional record of this hearing. So if you wish to comment for the hearing record, please submit your written uh, comments within 10 working days to uh, the U.S. House of Representatives, Subcommittee on Forest and Forest Health, um, Longworth Building, Washington, D.C., 20515. Now, for any questions with regards to this, please see uh, our staff director, Mr. Doug Crandall, who is right here at my left. For any further details, cards with all pertinent information are available here and uh, Mr. Crandall will be able to provide those for you. So please just ask any of my staff or any of the congressional staff that you recognize here in the room for assistance. Today we are here to talk about one of the most serious risks facing the people of New Mexico, risk to their lives and to their homes from forest fires on unmanaged, overstocked federal forests. Congress has been concerned about this problem for nearly 15 years. 15 years, and I have been pushing hard for a, a, a program and a policy that really will save our national forests ever since I became chairman of this, of this uh, committee. Most recently, this subcommittee held a hearing in Washington with documented facts, sad facts. Some 51 million acres of of federal forest lands are currently at high risk of catastrophic fire, 51 million acres, and that federal agencies have, have not implemented any cohesive strategy to deal with this problem. Now, it's an interesting thing, but a cohesive strategy was presented 
and was written by Lyle, uh, Lyle Lafferty, regional forester out of uh, Colorado, signed also, presented by Mike Dombeck, uh, Jerry Williams, uh, report team co-leader, um, Hilda Diaz Soltero, Associate Chief of Natural Resources, Phil Janik, Associate Chief, Chief, Chief Operating Officer. All of these people put together a cohesive strategy and this was presented last April. Last April. Now I spent, <clears throat> a couple of days ago, I spent all day in the, in the woods with um, President Clinton and three other of his cabinet members, including Chief Dombeck and the Secretary of Agriculture, um, Mr. Glip Glickman. And the President, after being very sobered by, by seeing the forest fires that were going on in the Northwest, it was a sobering experience. You could see it on their face. Went back and called for a cohesive strategy with his chief standing right beside him. The chief signed a cohesive strategy that called for mechanical means and a restoration of our forests last April before these fires started. Interestingly, interestingly enough, this cohesive strategy appeared on the web the Forest Service website, April 15th. But strangely enough, it disappeared April 16th. What happened? And why is the President now going back and asking his people to do another plan? Something is wrong. Are they not talking together? Whatever the problem is, we are losing forests. We are losing homes. We are losing private property out here. And we have an administration that can't get it together. And I am asking, can this administration do anything other than put plans together and write more plans? It's how could we have ever won a war just by writing plans? This is a war. This is the real war on the West because we are losing our assets. People are losing their homes. The public, of course, to some degree, needs to be aware of their part too. People want to live in and around forests. Suburbs are expanding everywhere into what used to be forest lands, creating a wildland urban interface where fire risk is higher, high and firefighting is dangerous and expensive. The burden of reducing risk does not fall alone on the government. People need to become more involved. And those who are living in the wildland urban interface need to make sure that their private property is maintained in a low fuel state. Yet, it is to the federal agencies that citizens rightly look for leadership, beginning with good examples of stewardship practiced on federal lands. But the public has been disappointed in what it sees, and rightfully so. And we in the Congress are also desperately disappointed. This administration's environmental policies are driven by a preservationist elite who are dogmatically and irrationally opposed to active forest management of public lands, even for the, even for the purpose of reducing fire risks. Their theology, and that's what it is, a theology which reflects an anti-science, anti-business, anti-people bias that rejects reasoned and effective application of forest and fire management techniques. Logging is considered to be profane, and making a profit from logging is considered to be a sin. They believe that fire is the only righteous way to treat these high-risk forests, and they would rather see the forests burn catastrophically than to be managed. Now, in essence, they believe that it is necessary to destroy the forest in order to save it. It, it really doesn't have to be this way. Many people know what needs to be done to remedy this problem. The Forest Service has written a series of interesting and promising plans like, like this cohesive management strategy. But plans are worthless if they're never implemented on the ground. And we, you in New Mexico, are keenly aware of this. As Aldo Leopold once said, the only progress that really counts is that on the landscape of the back 40. Now, I can agree with him on that. Today, federal land management agencies are not making any progress at all on the back 40. Indeed, we are closer today to losing the back 40 and the rest of the forest than we ever have been before. 
I have received testimony before this committee where, where people have testified that the state of our national forests are in a state of near collapse. And it wasn't a matter of if they would burn, but just a matter of where and when. Today, we hear more about these failures and these problems, but we will also hear some success stories from managers who are making progress on the back 40. They are using mechanical treatments, thinning, partial harvest, brush clearing to reduce the fire risk, then reintroducing fire in the forest in the right conditions to restore natural processes. They are demonstrating that we do have the science and the experience and the ability to fix this problem of hazardous forest fuels to protect lives and to protect property. In some cases, they are even, even finding that the value of the products which are removed in the process can help pay for the cost of treatment. My goodness, to some, that's blasphemy. But you know, we look back to the 50s and the 60s when because of the way the Forest Service was managed, the Forest Service as an entire agency made a profit, Chairman Skeen. They made a profit. Chairman Skeen didn't have to uh, appropriate hundreds of, mil of millions of dollars to support the Forest Service. They supported themselves. Even beyond the, the timber program, the whole agency uh, supported themselves. My, how it has changed. What federal agencies have been lacking until now frankly, is the political will to do what must be done, to actively manage forests in the wildland-urban interface in order to minimize risk, and to do this in the face of opposition from a very small but fanatically and well-financed elite who are determined to prevent rational management of our federal lands. Now, if the federal agencies can't lead and they won't follow, then they should get out of the way and let the rest of us, especially you, get on with it. Mr. Chairman, um, I would like to uh, recognize you, and then I will recognize Mr. Udall for your opening statement. I want to thank the uh, Subcommittee on Forest and Forest Health, the Chairman, the Chair Lady, Mrs. Helen Chenoweth uh, Hayes, for holding this hearing today here in New Mexico. A few months ago, which now seems like light years ago, I asked her for assistance regarding the buildup of the urban wildfire interface in our New Mexico mountain communities. She promised that we would hold hearings on this subject in Washington, D.C., and that there would be a field hearing in New Mexico. Shortly thereafter, the U.S. Interior Department of Los Alamos disaster took place, followed quickly by major fires at Rio Doso, New Mexico, and Scott Abel fire near Claude Croft. The Congresswoman and her very capable staff have continued to work overtime on these important forest health and fire danger issues. They have continually warned us in Congress about the mismanagement and the lack of cohesive plan or even a strategy by the Clinton administration to address the problems that exist in the West. And that's those of us who serve uh, from Western states have a terrible time trying to inoculate some knowledge and, and uh, so forth in some of our Eastern cohorts. They continually warned us in Congress about the mismanagement and the lack of cohesive plan and even strategy by the Clinton administration to address the problems that exist in the West. It's now apparent that the New Mexico fires were just a preview of what is quickly becoming a summer 2000 fire tour. According to figures last Wednesday, there have been 64,265 fires causing damage to 4.3 million acres already this year. And to give you some perspective, the 10-year average is 54,845 fires impacting 2.3 million acres for the entire year. On Wednesday of last week alone, there were 278 fires that had already been burned 12, 142,000 acres and cost 12.9 million a day to fight. No one here will claim that uh, there will not be fires in our forests, but many of us will claim that the severity and the damaging nature of these current fires could have been avoided if the U.S. Forest Service leadership would have protested the disastrous policies of their political leaders. The administration's love affair with controlled burns at the expense of other forest management practices has led us down the path to the, to the, the current situation. And I feel truly sorry for the Forest Service employees on the ground that who have been forced by their Washington, D.C. leadership in many cases to turn their backs on the people who live in or near our national forests. Today, I want to listen to the, what these witnesses tell us, so my remarks will be short and, and 
hearing is uh, for the citizens of, of New Mexico. One other additional comment to make. We have uh, within our boundaries in New Mexico a group of people who handle forest fires and conditions better than anybody else, and that's the Indian tribes in our area, the Apaches, have the best forest service management practice of any of the people and organizations in our city. And thank you for being here, Helen. I really appreciate uh, all that you've done, and also the other members of Congress that have been here today. It's time we did something about this situation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, the chair now recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Udall, for his opening statement. Th thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And I also want to echo what uh, has been said by uh, my colleagues that we very much appreciate you bringing the subcommittee. It's, this is, uh, I'm a member of the subcommittee and, and uh, have been to many hearings with you. And we're very proud that you have uh, brought this subcommittee to New Mexico for this important hearing and to hear uh, the citizens of New Mexico on these important points. Um, I, I'd like to open today uh, with the idea that if we're getting into the blame game here, uh, there's plenty of blame to go around. Uh, Republican and Democratic administrations have contributed to the crisis we are in today. Uh, Smokey the Bear was not a Republican or Democratic idea. Fire suppression has been a policy adopted by Democratic and Republican administrations for over 100 years. So let's not use long-term problems that have, been, have existed at the, at the federal level and state level uh, for uh, these are long-term problems. Let's not use them for short-term uh, political gain. As we all know, we are witnessing one of the worst wildfire seasons in 50 years. More than 64,000 wildfires have been reported across the nation this year. Most of you remember the 1998 fire season when part of Yellowstone National Park burned. During that year, approximately 2.6 million acres were, t were consumed. Already this year, we have seen more than 4.2 million acres scorched, and the end is not in sight. If weather conditions continue as they have, we could see fires burning for an additional three months. The danger from these large, severe fires, including May, last May's Cerro Grande fire and the Vivash fire that raged in my district needs to be stopped or reduced. To avert future wildland fire calamities, forest health needs to be improved. But how do we fix this complex problem? Part of the answer to this question can be found by looking at the current health of our forests. If we do this carefully, I think we can see the possibility of reducing large-scale catastrophic fires and at the same time provide jobs for traditional rural communities. To affect such a change, one must understand the dynamics of forest ecology and forest history. Many of the forests in the Intermountain West, from the Black Hills of South Dakota <coughs> to the Cascades and the Sierra Nevada mountain range, and from the Canadian border to Arizona and New Mexico, are dominated by pines, especially Ponderosa, Western White, and Lodgepole Pines. The pine ecosystems of the West are considered by many to be in an unnatural and unhealthy condition, with excessive numbers of trees and excessive tree mortality. This has led to crowded, more combustible forest stands and stands that are susceptible to insect and disease epidemics. The result is an increased risk of catastrophic fire, as we've seen recently in Los Alamos and the Pecos area of my congressional district and in Representative Skeen's district near Cloudcroft. Other important influences on the forest health problems in New Mexico has, have developed over many decades. Although the, de the deterioration of the forest may have been accelerated by the periods of drought we have seen recently. Some of the problems began with livestock overgrazing in the forests in the 1800s. Heavy grazing reduced vegetative competition for the trees, especially from grasses that play a role in inhibiting tree regeneration and growth. Logging has exacerbated the problem. 
problem. Logging's emphasis on cutting large diameter, old growth pines accelerated the accumulation of trees and brushy plant species in areas formerly dominated by a lesser cover of old growth trees. Additionally, the increasing reach of human habitation and economic activities into forested areas has altered the balance of vegetation and wildlife activity in these areas. Another significant cause relates to the fire suppression over the past 75 years that virtually eliminated the natural cycle of frequent flyers. Absent large human activity and intrusion, this natural cycle serves to suppress the acceleration of old growth trees and grass dominated open spaces. These factors have all altered our western pine forests. Over the decades, these forests have seen substantial increases in fuel materials, historically frequent Low density fires in Ponderosa pine forests reduce these fuels, killing many of the seedlings and saplings. According to a recent study on the Santa Fe National Forest, in a natural state, the forest around the Santa Fe watershed would have been between 40 and 80 larger diameter trees per acre. Today, because of the years of fire suppression, some areas of the watershed have as many as 2,000 trees per acre. In northern Arizona, the Coconino National Forest averaged 23 trees per acre prior to settlement, but now has 851 trees per acre. What can be done? One principal goal of forest health improvement should be to reduce the biomass. Small diameter trees and dead or dying trees should be reduced. Several tools exist for improving forest health. One of the most frequently mentioned is salvage timber sales. Salvage timber sales can be used to remove dead, dying, and threatened trees from the forest and therefore be useful in reducing biomass and in controlling insect and disease infestations. However, since commercial timber removal is directly related to quality, salvage timber sales have limited potential for reducing small diameter trees and can leave woody fuel material behind. We can also, I believe, regenerate our rural communities uh, with a jobs program that could do me mechanical thinning in many of these western forests. And I would like to see a, a, a program that which utilizes um, small operations like the, the uh, Taos Youth Corps, where young people are put into the forest, working with the Forest Service and under their supervision to do mechanical thinning. And, and I think there is a win-win situation out of this. If we move from uh, the politics of it into what needs to be done to make our forests healthy and sustainable over the long term, I think we can revive our rural communities. I think we can have healthy forests. And I think we can also uh, provide for the needs of our citizens. So with that, Madam Chair, uh, thank you once again for coming. And, and I look forward to hearing from the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Udall. And <clears throat> before introducing uh, and, and recognizing Mrs. Wilson, I want to say that I was, I was on the floor of the House when Mrs. Wilson uh, took to the floor and, and uh, gave a very moving and passionate floor speech about uh, what uh, this state has suffered through in, in its fires. And I can tell you, about half the people on the floor had trouble holding back the tears because not only did she uh, did she hit our minds with uh, the, the, the tremendous devastation that was going on here, but she also had the ability to hit our hearts, and that's unusual with uh, hard-bitten politicians. Sometimes she's uh, she's doing a, a remarkable job, and it's my pleasure to work with uh, with Mrs. Wilson. And uh, I want to thank you for inviting the committee down. And the chair now recognizes uh, Mrs. Wilson. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and I, I wanted to thank you also for allowing me to sit in. Most folks look at, at the first district in New Mexico and think of it as one of our urban districts in the West, and, and that it is, but it also borders a national forest that includes all of Torrance County in the East Mountain area that, uh, that, that borders right on this, this forest-urban interface. And it is, a, it is a district with significant amount of wild land and, and f national forest, and it's a, a significant concern to people here in New Mexico. But New Mexico is also a place that's still just kind of a, 
a big, small town. It's a neighborhood. And when a disaster happens in New Mexico, all New Mexicans pitch in. And that's the way it was with the Los Alamos fire and the Scott Abel fire, is that we all do what we can from where we are with what we've got. And that's what made me very proud to be a New Mexican over the last, the last several months. But it's hard for folks outside of the West to understand what the West is going through this summer and the nature of these catastrophic wildfires in the West that, that some people just see a glimpse of on their television screens and don't really understand what communities are going through and the, what the risks are. Following the disaster in Los Alamos, the initial focus was on getting the federal government to take responsibility for the fire, to set up a system to compensate the victims of the fire, and we have now done that. The, the Senate and the House passed compensation legislation, and the President has signed it, and that's going forward. And to me, that was first and foremost what we had to do. We've also provided some additional funding to fight fires this summer, because we know it's, it's going to be a bad summer. And the agencies that have to fight these fires and deal with the consequences need the resources to do that. And we've added that into the interior spending bill to the tune of about $350 million. Now, you put those things together, compensation to the victims of Los Alamos of $600 million and $350 million more on top of what's already budgeted to fight fires in the West just this year alone. We're near a billion dollars to fight the consequences of poor management in the forests. We need to get more proactive and less reactive. We're still dealing with the aftermath of the Los Alamos fire and the Scott Abel fire and others around the West, trying to protect the environment, make sure that the water runoff is OK, and protect the water supply that affects all of New Mexico. I didn't have a view about controlled burns or about forest management practices before the Los Alamos fire. But I have to say that following that fire and seeing the after action reports and the evidence that came out, I lost confidence that the National Park Service could properly conduct a controlled burn, and I wouldn't want them anywhere near my house. I want to see that the Park Service and other federal land management agencies understand the nature of the change they have to go through in order to regain our confidence of using fire as a management tool in the forest. They didn't have the planning, the training, the controls, the reviews, the backup in place they needed to do what they were trying to do. And if you don't have those things in place, you shouldn't light a match in the forest. Unless they understand the complete change that has to take place in those agencies, I don't think they should be doing prescribed burns. But what we've seen in the West this summer particularly, and what I've learned after the Los Alamos fire, raises questions about forest management as well. And I don't claim to be an expert on it. I'm learning just like everybody else. And I look forward to the testimony here today from people who've spent their lives looking at the forest and trying to manage our forests. But it seems to me that there are some alternatives to prescribed burns, that our, that our forests have become overgrown and overcrowded, that our communities are closer to our forests, and managing that interface is more important than it ever has been. But when we have a situation of a high fire danger in the East Mountains, and the fire experts go out and teach private <coughs> landowners how to clear the lower brush and how to protect their homes and what to do, and they do it, and you see proper management on private lands, and yet you walk over the line and see overcrowded, overgrown public land that's threatening private land, you know, we've got a problem. I don't think we can rely on fire alone to manage our national forests and our, and our park lands. And yet there has been resistance to clearing by hand and by saw even when it's done as a community project by people who live near that land and who want to make sure the forest is healthy and that their homes and lands are protected from a fire that may start on public land. That, to me, doesn't make any sense. And we need to get back to a little more common sense. There was at least one published report that the public service company wanted to remove some 
down trees to, to reduce uh, some of the risks around the, po the power lines. Uh, unfortunately, that was resisted and disapproved because of a possible threat to nests for owls. Well, one of those trees fell on a power line. We lost 16,000 acres of habitat because we wanted to protect the nests. And that doesn't make any sense. And we need to get back to common sense management of our public lands in cooperation with the people who live there. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mrs. Wilson. <clears throat> and we're at the point now where we, we get to hear from you. But uh, just recently, I asked the G GAO to do a study on the lessons learned from the Sierra Grande fire. And GAO is here from Washington, D.C., and they will be our first witnesses. So at this time, I'd like to recognize Mr. Barry Hill, who is the Associate Director for Energy Resources and Science Issues from the USG, uh, United States General Accounting Office in Washington, D.C. Uh, Mr. Hill is accompanied by Mr. Chester Joy and by Mr. Alan Domenici. Now, gentlemen, you know the drill, don't you, that this committee chairman always asks the all outside witnesses to swear under the oath. Um, you're familiar with the committee rules, and so at this time, if you would stand and raise your hand to the square. Do you promise and affirm under the penalty of perjury that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Thank you. Mr. Hill, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the subcommittee. <clears throat> Before I begin, uh, you have introduced uh, Mr. Alan Dominici and uh, Chet Joy, but we also have Linda Chu, who's going to be assisting us in the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, all three of them were heavily involved in developing the information we'll be presenting today. <clears throat> And because of the length of my testimony, if Mr. I Hill, I wonder these mics are, are not very strong. I wonder if you could pull that mic Maybe right I'll up a little closer. Okay. Can you hear me now? We can. Uh, and because of the length of my testimony, if I may, I'd like to just as quickly as I can summarize my prepared statement and submit the full text of the statement for the record. Without objection, <clears throat> so ordered. Madam Chairman, as you well know, at your request, GAO has actively been involved in assisting your subcommittee investigate federal efforts to address catastrophic wildfire threats. Over the past three years, we've reported on the severity of the risk that catastrophic wildfires pose to resources and communities, the adequacy of federal preparedness and suppression expenditures and efforts, and the adequacy of the federal strategy to address this serious problem. We are here today to report on the results of another serious issue that you requested us to investigate, the circumstances surrounding the tragic and devastating wildfire that occurred in and around Los Alamos, New Mexico, officially known as the Cerro Grande Fire. My statement today will provide a chronology of and lessons learned from that fire, and on a broader note, actions needed to mitigate current hazardous fire conditions in the interior west. Before I discuss the Cerro Grande fire, I think it's important to provide some context to, to the points we'll be making today. Each year, federal land management agencies carry out hundreds of prescribed burns, and the vast, majorities, the, the vast majority of these are done without incident. However, when a prescribed fire does get out of control, like the one we'll be talking about today, it's imperative that the events surrounding the incident be closely reviewed to determine what can be learned to help prevent such occurrences in the future? This kind of analysis, of course, is after the fact and has the benefit of hindsight. We did not have the burden of making urgent, on-the-spot decisions in the midst of trying to manage an ongoing fire. Accordingly, we're not here to point fingers, but to help improve the way federal land management agencies manage future prescribed burns. And with that spirit in mind, I can summarize the overall results of our work by saying that the Cerro Grande fire exposed a number of policy and procedural issues that need to be addressed for managing prescribed fires. Most of the issues involve policy or procedural gaps or a lack of clarity about how policies or procedures are to be applied. These issues affected both the planning and the implementation of the burn. Some of these issues are specific to the Bandelier National Monument and the National Park Service. However, others involve other federal agencies. 
Those problems that are not site or agency specific raise questions about the current readiness of the federal land management agencies to effectively support and administer prescribed burns as a forest management tool. Before proceeding with the discussion of our, our specific findings, I'd like to show some slides we've prepared on the Cerro Grande fire. And these slides will take you from the start of the fire on the evening of May 4th to its substantial containment on May 19th of this year. And a copy of these slides are also attached to our prepared statement, but we're going to have the presentation right here to your left. <clears throat> Is it possible to dim the lights a little bit? You bet, they just won't pay the bill. <laughs> Save a little money that way, right? Yeah, leave a little money. There's a man that knows how. I have a laser pointer and it's not gonna show up very well if it's uh, <laughs> too much light. Uh, Madam Chairman, this first slide provides an overview of the uh, location of the, uh, the, Bandelier, the Bandelier National Monument and the Cerro Grande area where the prescribed burn uh, was ignited. And it also shows the surrounding land. The, in, to, the, to the north and the west is the Baca Ranch. To the, to the north and the east the Santa Fe National Forest. And directly to the east is the town of Los Alamos and the Los Alamos National Lab. This, this slide shows the prescribed burn area consisting of about 1,000 acres of varying types of vegetation. The light green area indicates a meadow with sparse trees. The darker green area indicates an area with medium density of trees, and that dark green area indicates the, the heavy, uh, heaviest density of trees. The uh, next slide superimposes the uh, three phases. Could, could you do the next slide? There you go. The next slide superimposes the three fa phases of the, um, the prescribed burn. Um, and the, the original plan was to uh, conduct the, um, the prescribed burn on the first two phases of the, of the area to kind of serve as a fire break for that phase three area, which was the more dense area of the trees. And then at a, a later date, they were going to do the phase three area. And then that whole area would serve as a fire break for the uh, Frijoles Canyon area down there in the south, which was a really heavy uh, density, uh, an area with a heavy density of trees and had a very, very high risk. <clears throat> now this picture shows the uh, aerial view of the prescribed burn area and uh, the Cerro Grande Peak uh, is on the north end of the uh, burn area and the uh, Frijoles Canyon is in the, the uh, southern portion of the area. And on this slide, we have superimposed basically those same three phases of the burn area that I just described. Now, this picture shows a typical vegetation in the phase one area on the northeast side of the peak. And as you can see, it's a grassy area with few trees. Now with that background, let me run through a chronology of the fire. The, um, the prescribed burn started on Thursday, May 4th at 7.20 in the evening when the Park Service ignited the test fire in the uh, upper right, up, upper corner where the number one is, at the peak of the northern tip of the burn area. At the start of the prescribed burn, there were 19 people on site, 10 BIA and nine Park Service staff. The wind direction was uh, four miles per hour from the west and everything was in with, uh, within acceptable parameters of the burn plan. <clears throat> After about 40 minutes, the test fire was completed. The uh, black lining, which is a fire break procedure, using hand torches and water, directed the fire line from the summit down the northeast side. Uh, also at this time, the burn boss decided to stop suppressing the fire on the interior side of the ignition lines. At 10 o'clock on Thursday, the black lining procedure was completed on the northeast side. At that time, the burn boss hiked to the top of the hill and he observed a fire growing on the northwest side toward the Baca Ranch. He requested that several people from the east side be moved to the northwest side. Four hours after igniting the test fire, the fire was moving down the center of the hill faster than anticipated. Therefore, the decision was made to start blacklining on the northwest side to control and stay ahead of the fire. About six and a half hours into the burn, the blacklining stopped on the northwest side of the hill. 
and at that time, 15 of the 21 crew members were sent off the hill for rest. This was an unplanned event that occurred because the BIA crew members were inexperienced and became fatigued earlier than expected. The burn boss sent them off the hill because he thought it would be unsafe to leave them on the fire. At this time, only six people are left to hold the fire, four on the west and two on the east, while the fire continues to spread downhill. By 3 o'clock in the morning, the burn boss called the Santa Fe dispatch office for contingency resources. He was told that no resources could be, spent, could be sent to a prescribed fire, but, it, but that he should call back in the morning. Oh my gosh. At this time, the burn boss also ordered a park fire engine to be sent, and that arrived at 5.45 in the morning. By 7.30 in the morning, the fire was continuing to spread down the interior of the mountain, mainly on the east side, where the black lining had stopped. At this time, only eight Park Service staff are on hand to manage the growing fire. The burn boss contacted the dispatch again at 7.30 in the morning and, and requested additional resources. And at that time, the dispatch agreed to divert a helicopter and a hotshot crew to the prescribed fire. These resources arrived on scene several hours later. <clears throat> at 10 o'clock Friday morning, because of fatigue, the burn boss was replaced, as mutually agreed, by a very experienced burn boss from the Park Service's regional office. Shortly thereafter, the fire moved outside the black line, causing a slop over of about a quarter of an acre in size on the east side. You can see that area right there. Still only eight Park Service staff remained on the site to control the fire at this time. There were four that were positioned on the west side and four on the east side. At 10.30 Friday morning, the helicopter arrives, and at 12.30, the hotshot crew arrives, some seven to nine hours after the burn boss originally requested these resources. With the added crew, there are now 28 people on the fire, nine positioned on the west and 19 on the east. But now the slop over has grown to several acres in size and is moving towards areas with a heavier density of trees, primarily to the east toward the Santa Fe National Forest and to the south to that denser grove of trees. At 1 o'clock on Friday afternoon, due, due to the slop over and the need for additional resources to contain the fire, the fire is declared a wildland fire. At this time, an air tanker carrying retardant and additional crews were ordered. On Friday afternoon, the additional resources arrive. At 2.15 and 3.40, air tankers arrive dropping two loads of retardant on the slop over, and around 4.30, additional firefighters arrive, bringing the total number to 45 and they've positioned 35 of them on the east side and 10 on the west side. By late in the afternoon, the slop over was successfully contained. <clears throat> on Friday afternoon, once the prescribed burn was declared a wildland fire, the firefighting strategy was changed to emphasize suppression. There were two options or approaches considered to put out the fire. The first was the, the direct approach, and the second was an indirect approach. This aerial view of the burn shows the direct approach, and this approach essentially would have contained the fire by constructing a black line across the mountain. Although this approach was the quickest way to shut down the fire, the burn boss decided against it because he did not consider it safe for the firefighters. This aerial view shows the indirect approach that was ultimately used, and the intent of this approach was to contain the fire by using the pre-existing control lines and Route 4, which is that highway running right down there below the uh, dotted line, to black line the east, the south, and the west sides of the burn unit. Uh, this approach, although considered safer for firefighters, had the added risk of allowing the fire to expand to a much larger area. By 11 o'clock Friday night, the firefighters began black lining on the east side. 45 firefighters were on the site at this time. This picture shows the significance of the transition from phase one to the phase two area on the east side. And as you can see, the black lining operations is entering an area in which there is a heavier concentration of trees. <coughs> on Saturday morning, actual on-site weather observations show west-northwest winds at six to 10 miles an hour. However, a spot weather forecast reported red flag warnings for Saturday and a fire weather watch for Sunday. A red flag warning is when the sustained winds are forecasted above 25 miles an hour, relative humidity is less than 15%, and the fire danger is relatively high. 
A fire weather watch is when a forecaster is reasonably confident that the red flag event will occur with the next 20, within the next 24 to 72 hours. At 9.15 in the morning, the crews were continuing to line the east side and more firefighters were ordered. According to the regional dispatch center in Albuquerque, two crews were available later that afternoon. However, even with the red flag warning and weather watch, the burn boss only requested and received one crew. Late Saturday evening, the new crew arrived, and this is the crew that the dispatch agreed to send at 9.15 that morning. Now there's a total of 59 people on site, and with the additional firefighters on site, they started to black line on the west side, while the, the crews continued to black line on the east side. By Sunday morning, prior to 9 o'clock, the black lining had reached Route 4 on the east side and was proceeding west along the highway to a point just short of the curve of Frijoles Canyon. On the west side, the black lining had been completed to the top of the meadow near Route 4. Around 9 o'clock in the morning, a reconnaissance pilot noticed a surface fire in the meadow in the southwest corner. No actual on-site weather observations were taken Sunday morning, but the pilot estimated the winds at about 10 to 15 miles an hour. However, similar to Saturday, a red flag warning was issued for Sunday. Winds were forecasted out of the southwest at 20 to 30 miles an hour, and at this point in time, there are 79 people on the fire. <clears throat> on Sunday morning between 10 and 11 o'clock, a helicopter crew observed trees torching in the southwest corner. Other firefighters also observed fires in the southwest corner near Route 4, about the same time frame. Consequently, a fire engine and a crew were sent to the southwest corner to address the fires. Between 11 and 11.30 Sunday morning, chemical devices called ping pong balls, as, as illustrated by these things there, were dropped from the helicopter to ignite the fire in the west side of the burn area. Although no actual weather data were available, the pilot recalled that the winds were calm. About midday on Sunday, the winds increased from the west with some gusts estimated up to about 50 miles an hour. In addition, a division supervisor on the scene said that some gusts had shifted and were also coming from the north as well. Around this time, a crown fire occurred just above Route 4, crossed Route 4 into Frijoles Canyon, and caused spot fires to the east. <clears throat> Shortly thereafter, the spot fires grew rapidly, especially to the east. Subsequently, evacuation decisions were initiated and a Type 1 incident command team and additional fire resources were ordered. Questions remain as to the source of the fire in the southwest corner. From our review of the documentation on the fire, including the interagency investigative team report, the fire-related evidence collected and numerous interviews that we conducted with firefighters and other agency officials, the source of the Crown Fire in the southwest corner is still uncertain. This aerial view shows the path of the fire on Sunday morning. And starting on early Sunday morning, here's the area in that southwest corner where the uh, surface fires and torching trees were observed. And then by Sunday, um, by Sunday, later Sunday morning, the fires moved just north of that Route 4 area, and by noon, they had hopped over the, to the Frijoles Canyon and then began spotting toward the east and moving toward the Santa Fe National Forest and the town of Los Alamos. <clears throat> by late Sunday afternoon, the fire had expanded to the Santa Fe National Forest, and now there's about 100 firefighters on the fire. Concerned about the rapid escalation of the fire and its potential threat to the lab in the town of Los Alamos, Decisions were made on road closures, evacuations, additional resource orders, and fire suppression strategies. The fire suppression strategy was developed and initial efforts were begun to burn out sections along Route 4, Route 4501, this area here, Route 4501 and the Camp May Road. Essentially, they were trying to box the fire in there before it got to the town and the lab. On Monday, May 8th, the Type 1 incident commander, command team assumed control of the fire, and at this time, the fire was moving toward the, to, toward the lab. There was about 330 firefighting, firefighters, including about 100 structural firefighters, fighting spot fires on the lab. <clears throat> Plus, there was other equipment such as aircraft, fire engines, and bulldozers on the scene. 
The line construction and burnout continued along the Camp May Road and routes 501 and 4, and wind speed was measured at 15 to 25 miles an hour from the northwest. By the end of the day, the, the, the burn area had amounted to 3,000 acres at this point. On Tuesday, the fire is spreading northeast, threatening the lab and the town, and there's about 500 firefighters on the scene. The, the firefighters continued line construction and black lining along the Camp May Road and the junctions of Route 4 and 501, and airdrops were being used to help control the fire. Wind speed was measured at 10 to 15 miles an hour from the west-southwest, and the forecast for May 10th was for 15 to 25 mile an hour winds. By the end of the day, the burn area amounted to 3,700 acres. <clears throat> On Wednesday, the wind speeds picked up substantially, measuring at 20 to 50 miles an hour from the west. And because of these high winds, the aerial drop operations had to be halted, and the fire made a major run. The fire spread toward the town and the lab, breaking out in two places, crossing the Camp May Road toward the town and crossing the junctions of Route 4 and 501 toward the lab. During the day, firefighter, fire line resources were moved to safety zones. The town of Los Alamos was evacuated, and efforts continued at protecting structures in the lab and in the town. By the end of the day, the fire had burned a total of 10,000 acres and an unknown number of homes and structures in the town and on the lab. On Thursday, the fire spread north of Los Alamos, and the wind speed was measured at 20 to 50 miles an hour from the west, resulting in intense burning and extreme fire behavior. By the end of the day, the burn area amounted to 19,000 acres. From Friday, May 12th until Sunday, May 19th, over 1,000 firefighters were on the fire. The fire ultimately burned northwest to Route 601 and to the east through the Los Alamos lab and toward Route 502, until it was finally put under control. By the time it was over, the fire had become the largest wildfire in New Mexico's history. In total, the fire had burned about 48,000 acres, had damaged or destroyed about 280 homes, and destroyed about 40 minor structures at the lab. It had displaced over 400 families and caused an estimated damage of about $1 billion. <clears throat> Madam Chairman, clearly many important lessons are to be learned from the experience at Cerro Grande. For discussion purposes, we have categorized these lessons into two broad categories, those being issues dealing with planning for a prescribed burn and issues dealing with implementing a burn. <clears throat> Starting with the planning issues, we identified three important lessons that could improve the management of future prescribed burns. First, prescribed burn plans are not peer-reviewed by independent, knowledgeable individuals. This kind of independent review would pro provide for an objective analysis of the burn plan and would provide an additional check and balance on what is an inherently risky and dangerous activity. Second, confusion exists over the availability and use of contingency resources to help manage prescribed fires. The Cerro Grande fire demonstrated that the agency's relevant policies and procedures contain no standard definition of what contingency resources are, how they are to be identified, or when and how they are to be used. If this confusion had been worked out prior to the Cerro Grande fire, it's possible that the fire would have never gotten out of control. Finally, there's a need for more effective coordination and cooperation among federal agencies, nearby communities, and other parties that might be affected by a prescribed burn. While officials from the park Los Alamos National Laboratory and the Forest Service knew that the most likely wildfire threat to the town of Los Alamos was from the area of the prescribed burn, these parties did not work together well enough to mitigate this threat. The Cerro Grande fire underscores the need for more substantive coordination and cooperation to occur in a way that puts public safety first, overcomes agency or other jurisdictional boundaries, and achieves buy-in by the affected parties. In addition to these planning issues, we, are, we also identified three important lessons to be learned from the implementation of this prescribed burn, and let me briefly summarize what these are. First, before an agency ignites a fire, it should be assured that all the necessary preparatory steps have been completed. Current policy and procedures do not require that agencies document the completion of all the necessary preparatory steps prior to igniting a fire. 
The events at Cerro Grande demonstrate a need to change current policies so that the documented record of this decision-making process is required for every prescribed burn. Second, public safety should take precedent over resource protection considerations in deciding on which firefighting tactics should be used once a wildfire is declared. While existing Park Service policy requires fire managers to protect resources while trying to suppress a wildfire, the policy should be revised so that there is no doubt that in instances like Cerro Grande where the threat of a prescribed fire getting out of control poses direct and serious public safety risks to nearby communities, fire suppression should be the top priority. Finally, there's little guidance on the amount and experience of firefighting resources needed to implement prescribed burns. A more structured, systematic approach should be developed to assist fire managers in making resource decisions. To make sure the lessons of Cerro Grande are addressed by the responsible agencies, we've, we've made a number of recommendations to revise and clarify the existing fire management policy and to improve the way future prescribed burns are handled. And I'm pleased to report that the agencies have agreed with our recommendations and have said that they plan to implement them. Finally, let me briefly touch on the actions we feel are needed to mitigate the current hazardous forest conditions that have led to the significant and unprecedented number of catastrophic wildfires that we are currently experiencing. The Cerro Grande fire reveals the extreme difficulties that federal land management agencies are having coping with the increasingly grave risks of catastrophic wildfires. Because the normal cycle of fire has been disrupted, disrupted by decades of fire suppression, Vegetation in many forests has accumulated and created high levels of fire fuels. These conditions in turn have transformed much of the western part of the nation into a virtual tinderbox. Without actions to reduce these accumulated fuels, the current trend of more frequent and more intense wildfires can be expected to continue and perhaps even get worse. Effectively addressing this issue will require changes in land management priorities at all levels. Earlier this year, in response to our recommendation, the Forest Service developed a strategy to address this problem. This is a good start and provides something for the Forest Service to build on. However, we believe that a similar strategy should also be developed for the Department of Interior Lands so that there will be a coherent approach across all federal lands. As we understand it, Interior is now developing such a plan. Also, currently, the Congress is considering an additional $240 million in funding for fuel reduction activities. If this funding is provided, we are concerned that there be adequate accountability to ensure that the funds are spent on the highest priority areas first. In this regard, it's important for the Congress to ensure that the agencies identify which lands meet the priority criteria and that the additional funding be spent only on these lands. Madam Chairman, this concludes my statement. We'd be happy to respond to any questions that you or other members may have. Thank you, Mr. Hill. That uh, your port report was extraordinary, and I appreciate your good work. Thank you. Um, you mentioned in your report that uh, current federal guidance uh, requires minimizing both cost and damage to resources. Um, how did this guidance factor into the, into the uh, referenced fire, the Sierra Grande fire? The guidance factored in very heavily in terms of the preparation work that was done as well as what, what, what occurred when they were implementing uh, tactics to deal with the fire. Um, in terms of um, the preparation work, uh, there's a certain amount of thinning and, and uh, mechanical removing that could be done to provide better and, and uh, uh, fire breaks that usually the Forest Service uses, but in this particular case, the Park Service uh, did not did not utilize uh, as many of the mechanical means for constructing broader and stronger fire lines as possible. They relied primarily uh, on using fire. Uh, in terms of once the fire got out of control, um, once again, tactics were used to uh, to use fire to basically create fire breaks and black lines, uh, as opposed to bringing in perhaps saws and bulldozers and and creating some uh, some fire lines that would help to uh, to minimize the damage and create better and stronger fire lines in the area. So it, it weighed in very heavily. And there's also a cost factor. And in numerous times during the, uh, the fire, there was an opportunity, I think, to, to, to get more resources. And those resources were not, were not obtained. I mean, they, inadequate resources was a problem all throughout the fire from the start 
throughout the entire uh, incident. And uh, had, had there been more resources available on site, more resources available as backup, and even resources that were offered during the wildfire that were, that were not accepted, I think this would have helped the situation. <clears throat> Mr. Hill, um, you're very good at your job, but I want to get right to the point. At any time during the initial stages of this fire was the decision made not to use bulldozers or any other mechanized equipment, and if so, what was the justification for this decision? We saw the results. Well, I, I, can, o I can only speak for the actions that occurred and, and, and to the visual inspection we made and to our knowledge and based on all the documentation we've seen, there, there, were, no, there were no saws, there were no bulldozers evident, no, uh, no evidence of any bulldozers or saws used on the Bandelier National Monument prior to the burn. Um, they did construct a, a, a fire line using axes, basically. It was a very, very small fire line, and um, we saw no evidence of that. Um, in your investigation, did you find out why they didn't use bulldozers or other mechanical means? It, here again, it's consistent with their, their basic policy uh, to, one, minimize costs and also to minimize the damage to the resource. Um, so. Their efforts here are intended to minimize the number of trees that are taken down and the amount of thinning, mechanical thinning that goes on prior to the burn. And they're trying to use techniques that rely primarily on, on putting fire on the ground to create these black lines. It didn't work, did it? Not in this case, no. Um, I mentioned in my opening statement, Mr. Hill, that the Forest Service has prepared a new cohesive strategy to reduce fuels. Mm. Um, as you had recommended last year, signed by the Chief of the Forest Service. And um, is this strategy, in your opinion, adequate? And will it prevent situations like the Sierra Grande in the future? Based on our read, I, I think it's a good start. It's a step in the right direction. But uh, there's a lot of things that are still lacking in that stra strategy. It's, it's, it's not specific enough. It identifies broadly the moderate to high risk areas. Um, and um, it also lays out the game plan in terms of the number of acres they plan to treat, uh, uh, showing an increase in the coming years of the number of acres up to three million, 3 million acres a year. What it doesn't do, though, is really target specific priority areas that they really need to address first. Obviously, this is going to be a big job. <clears throat> it's going to require a lot of money and a lot of resources. And what you want to do is direct the available funds and resources into those high priority areas. And it really does not get down to that level of specificity. I guess what we're, we're, our, our viewpoint of that is, it's a good it's, it's a good start on a strategy, but it's not it's it's not operationalized enough in terms of of action, in terms of what they can actually go out and start doing now. Now, <clears throat> we're asked the question about 240 million dollars being used for fuel reduction. I, I just so we're on the same wavelength, we're talking about thinning of trees, the overgrowth, and, and the smaller trees when you say fuel reduction, the money being spent? That's right. There's actually a, a number of tools that are used. You, you, could, you could use uh, mechanical removal, uh, basically chainsaws or dozers or things like that. But you can also use prescribed burns. Prescribed burns are also included in, in the, as one of the tools for fuel reduction. For fuel reduction. Now, we, we have a, a, a situation that's very comparable to the Cerro Grande fire in the Santa Fe watershed. Um, I, I've toured it with our forest supervisor, Leonard Atencio, and some of his top people. And it's clear to me from being briefed by them and listening to them that, that uh, it's just a matter of time before, it, unless we do something, before uh, a fire similar to the Cerro Grande fire breaks out in the Santa Fe watershed and has the same kind of impact with a crown fire, with destroying all the trees, with having the, the, the soil be degraded to the point that it can't even absorb water and you get huge runoff. And two of the consequences of a fire like that would be that 40% of the water, of the water supply for the city of Santa Fe, which is which is a city now, I think approaching 65 to 70 thousand people, would be wiped out because the the ash that would come into the water treatment plant would clog it, and, and there would be no uh, ability 
for uh, that, that water treatment plant to work with all of that ash flowing in. The second uh, consequence would be a possible large floods if rains took place afterwards that would come down through the city. If you're familiar with Santa Fe, the Santa Fe River flows right down through the city of Santa Fe. There isn't a huge amount of protection for uh, thousands of uh, uh, cubic feet of water flowing through the city. So you could have those kinds of conditions. And you talk about recommending that funds be spent on high priority areas. I, I would expect that, that these conditions are ones that, that you're talking about, where you have that urban uh, forest interface where you have the possibility of wiping out watersheds, where you have the possibility of, of, of a disaster in terms of flooding. Am, am I correct in, in assuming that, that you think those money should be spent in areas like that? Th those would be the highest priority areas. You, you identify them correctly. Okay. Thank Could you. Add, uh, one, one yeah, thing please, to add, Mr. Joy, that is that I think that underscores Mr. Hill's earlier statement in his prepared statement. The most critical thing for the Forest Service to do is to identify, and the other agencies, uh, assuming Interior does as well, as they state in their own strategy, it is not an oper operational strategy. The strategy says communities, ecosystems, watersheds, and species at risk. The question is, where is the list? And how quickly can it be prepared? Uh, so that one can find out whether, for instance, the Santa Fe watershed, where it should be treated and how. There may be species in there that you have, to, within it, that you have to take care of. There may be a host of considerations that have to be really well understood quickly. And, and what you're saying is that we should get that, to get that out there and on the table and, and start the discussion of, as to where we're going to spend these monies and, and get going with these uh, projects. Because it may be, and I, I'm not, not fully acquainted with the Santa Fe watershed, although I have had an opportunity recently, the last couple of days, to discuss with some persons about it. I don't know whether that, that's number 10 or number 200. And you don't know whether it's number 10 right, or whether it's right, 200. Right. Somebody has to tell us yeah, because, yeah. and that's the issue. Yeah, and, and I, I agree with you very much on that. And I, I also want to applaud our mayor who we're going to, the mayor of Santa Fe, who we're going to see on a later panel, who's also worked with Leonard Atencio and the Forest Service to try to come up with a plan. We have a situation there where the city lands, which owns the, the lands in the main part of the canyon that abut the forest areas, and so there needs to be a cooperative working relationship to move forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Udall. The chair recognizes Mrs. Wilson for, for questions. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hill, in your, um, in your testimony, you talked about delays in resources being available to fight the fire. The burn plan required a certain amount of resources to be available within two hours if things started to go wrong. Did the burn boss and the Park Service arrange for those resources to be available and something broke down with dispatch? Or did they just put it in the plan and not bother to make sure it really would be there? Uh, the, the Park Service did have in the, the plan that there were supposed to be contingency resources within a certain number of hours. Uh, prior to igniting the fire, they did call dispatch to make sure that those resources were available. There was a difference in policy, though the Forest Service Dispatch Center, the, the interagency dispatch center, would not dispatch those resources for a prescribed fire and the National Park Service did not interpret contingency resources the same way. And so as long as that was a prescribed fire, they would not be dispatched. And in <coughs> fact, when the, and that's the reason why they were denied at first when they called at 3.30 in the morning on the uh, night of the fire. And at 7.30 the next morning, the dispatch director had to circumvent policy, actually ordering those resources for another uh, wildfire, the Kwahi wildfire, which was burning to the north, and then diverting those resources to the prescribed fire. So when the Park Service put together its plan for this controlled burn, that they all signed off on up and down their chain that said so many resources would be available within two hours. Did they know they weren't telling the truth? They, uh, under their definition, they assumed that those resources would be available when needed. 
it was no, I the, remember from it was the school. dispatch center that had a different and this is a, this is a problem nationwide there is no definition of how those resources are to be dispatched and used nationwide you know it's hard to hear that word assume and not remember what it meant in high school mm -hmm. and I won't repeat it here <laughs> but it seems to apply with respect to one other thing that you mentioned on notification and notification of my neighbors. We're talking about park service property that's surrounded by a whole bunch of different agencies. Uh, and, and I wonder, was the state notified? Was Los Alamos Lab notified? Were the owners of the Baca Ranch notified of this prescribed burn? Was there communication at that level? Uh, yes, there was. There was uh, a number of months prior to the actual fire. It had been discussed in interagency group meetings. Uh, there were notifications sent out the actual day of the prescribed fire, numerous contacts with the Baca Ranch uh, in particular. Um, people knew that this was going to occur and when it was going to occur. It is my understanding, and we have, th this committee had testimony in Washington that the Los Alamos fire marshal, I guess, or fire director, fire manager, not sure what they call the fire title. Boss. Fire boss. The fire guy at Los Alamos recommended against starting this fire. Did you find any evidence for or against that? Uh, we found the contrary, that nobody prior to the start of the fire recommended that the fire not be lit. All of that came afterwards. The Baca Ranch refused to allow the fire to be conducted on its property. Is that correct? Uh, the Baca Ranch did not want the fire to spread onto their property uh, because of concerns of the impending sale to the U.S. government. And so they said no. And they, uh, they did not sign an agreement, so what uh, the Park Service did was change the burn plan the day of the burn so that fire would not spread to that land. In the procedures for the Park Service, it has a requirement for a pre-ignition checklist. Kind of, you know, uh, before you light the match, you go down through this checklist. Was that checklist used? Uh, according to the, uh, the Park Service people who were there, they did go through the checklist, although there is no requirement that it be formally documented. So they said they did, but there is no documentation to support that. And in that checklist, one of them is to get the forecast, not only for that day, but for a four-day forecast. Did they have the four-day forecast? They did not have a four-day forecast. They had a forecast for that day with conditions for the next day. And how could they have completed the checklist? I don't know. Does that raise questions in your mind as to whether they did the checklist at all? Well, I, we, we can debate whether they did or didn't, but the fact is that's I, one of the recommendations we're making is that from now on they need to document it to make sure that it has been done, they have gone through all the questions and everything checks out before they ignite the fire. You mentioned in your testimony that the second burn boss that they brought in was a very experienced man. Was the burn boss number one who would have done the checklist and who was calling dispatch and so on and released his BIA firefighters because they were tired, was he experienced to the same level? He had never done a burn of this magnitude. Uh, however, in, in part of the problem here was they underestimated the complexity of the burn and had they properly estimated the complexity of the burn it was it's more uh, it, it's it, it is very likely they would have gone with a much more experienced burn boss for this prescribed burn so this was his first time out this this was this was the largest the largest prescribed burn he had been involved in and the most complex one in a case where you have a burn boss who is stretching his abilities or learning new skills and we all do that in our jobs we is there some provision within the park service for budding or, ext or more extensive supervision or walking through the potential problems with him in advance so that, that he has a chance to succeed? Well, here again, that's another one of the recommendations we're making, the, the need for the, the burn plan to be peer-reviewed by some outside people. Right now, the current policy permits basically the unit doing the burn to do all the planning and reviewing and approving of the burn prior to igniting the fire. What we're saying is it would really make some sense to have an outside independent reviewer to come in and take one final look at that burn plan just to make sure there's nothing that's been overlooked. It would almost serve as a check and balance. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, just as a final concluding comment on that, it, it seems amazing to me that you'd have somebody who has not done a burn of this complexity before who is not getting help at all from his agency to make sure 
that he can accomplish his job successfully. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Wilson. The chair recognizes Chairman Skeen for his uh, test. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Questions? This is an excellent report and presentation that done by GAO. And I applaud you. You've done a good job with it. What bothers me is in this test, in your dissertation, whatever happened to tankers in the response to early fire starts and so forth, or continuations of fire. I asked this reason because I had a flying service out of Rio Dosa, which finally wound up being the, the boss, the fire bosses, flyers and so forth. But it was very accurate, and a very effective system of controlling fires at the early stages. And uh, we hear no more about it. What's, what, what's, what's happened to that response? Yeah, uh, air tankers were used initially on the slop over that occurred on Friday afternoon. Uh, there were two drops made. This uh, is how many hours after the beginning of the? Uh, this is when it was this is when it was declared a wildfire. So this would have been about one o'clock Friday afternoon. So this would have been the fire started seven o'clock uh, Thursday night. So it's going full bloom. Yes, this is when it was starting, but not when the uh, the big fire that was making its run towards Los Alamos. So do we have any tankers left anymore? Are they gone? Or we don't use them or what? Uh, there were tankers used in the uh, subsequent fire as it was moving towards Los Alamos, and I'm not sure exactly on the number of times there were drops and stuff like that. Uh, but for the initial prescribed burn area, uh, tankers were used just twice for drops there. Nice. There's an issue of cost and trying to minimize that, costs. That was and another question I'd like to ask. Is, is there a cost determination involved with this? Yes, I, I believe the cost per drop is around four or five thousand dollars per drop. It's very expensive. Yeah, and so <laughs> they try effective. to minimize costs. There, there's also the question of using retardant and protecting the resources again. Here again, uh, they they don't like to use the tankers to drop the retardant unless it's absolutely absolutely necessary because it does damage to the resources. I understand again. that, but they could also make it runs like that using a system that has the ability to fertilize as well. It might be, be kind of smelly, but it's very effective. <laughs> do we have any ages, ages, like, do we have any owners or operators of those tankers, any, any left anymore? That they can be called I believe on. there's yeah there's several companies that uh, operate that have a contract with the Forest Service that, that are that are called in. Sold out and uh, sent them to the Australians. I just wondered if there were any left. It's a great report that you folks did a good job on it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Skeen. Um, I have one more question and also just a short comment. Mr. Hill, your report is very good, but what impresses me is that your recommendations in the report are things that should have been instituted and being used all along. Uh, it seems as though this agency is bound up in paralysis of analysis. I mean, the idea that even an inexperienced fire boss ought to be able to tell when a prescribed burn has moved into a wildfire, and it shouldn't take an encyclopedia of criteria that he has to read through to understand his fire's out of control, and we need to call in the tankers, and, and if it takes other mechanical means, meaning bulldozers, uh, we need to do that. Uh, it's my understanding that the fire retardant, and I have asked Forest Service people about this, that the uh, compositions that they use in, in fire retardant uh, actually has a very minimal, almost benign effect on the natural resources. Uh, do you know otherwise? Is there something I don't know about that? Is, is, is there something out that says this retardant uh, creates uh, a, a remarkable reaction on the ground? Uh, here again, I think the, the Forest Service u utilizes the retardant much more than the Park Service. I think it's just, it, it gets back to this overall policy that the, the Park Service has to try and to deal with the situation using natural means, and they're defining natural means as basically using fire to prevent fire, as opposed to using mechanical means or dropping retardants on top of the resources. Well, Mr. Hill, there has also been a recent recommendation to limit the removal of trees during hazardous fuels removal operation to trees under 12 inches in diameter. Is there any science justifying a 12-inch diameter limitation for tree removal, uh, Mr. Joy? And uh, do, you, do you really feel this is an intelligent 
policy? Uh, there are places uh, in the interior west, as we understand it, from uh, where 12-inch trees are in short, or, or larger trees are in short supply because of the removal in the past of the larger trees. There are other places where 12 inch trees have grown up in greater abundance than they have historically been present. I'm sure Dr. Covington I suggests that you, you pursue this both with, uh, uh, with, with your witnesses in, in that panel who, have, um, who are, are far more understanding of, of the distribution of that than do I. But as I understand it, and please confirm with them, there are areas where there are uh, more 12 inch trees, 12 inch and above, than have historically been present because they've grown up in montane soils that were very rich, that were grasslands before. But on the other hand, there are other areas where there are less supply. I think what this again underscores is identifying where are the areas or risks to ecosystems of fire and what is there and what needs to be done to put them back in a correct order. So as far as the science goes, I think the science says some places yes, some places no. It all comes down to places. These are ecosystems, and if we're trying to preserve them, we have to understand what they are and where they are in order to take action to put the right ones in one, in, in put them into the right condition. It will differ by ecosystem. Well, sometimes 12 inch in diameter trees are 100 years old. Um, but the fact is for the Congress to say you can't cut any more than a 12 inch in diameter tree under salvage uh, conditions, does not always get us back to a healthy, vibrant forest. Um, I think very often as we think about prescribed fires in a healthy, vibrant forest, we'd like to envision the 40 trees per acre that, that is the ideal. But sometimes people forget that trees are just like humans. We are born, we live, and we die. And when trees get old and die, they fall to the forest floor, creating more of a, a fuel load. So um, what the Congress needs to do is to uh, to urge the agency to get back within the the law of the Forest Management Practices Act. I'd like to ask any of the other members on on uh, on the panel here to uh, if you have any other questions, Mr. Skeen. I have none. Thank Mrs. you. Mrs. Wilson. No. Mr. Udall. Uh, just uh, one question, Madam Chair. The, one of the points that you seem to be making, Mr. Hill, in your report is that that it's not just enough for the party that's initiating the prescribed burn to just notify surrounding agencies and landowners. Uh, in, in this case, we had the National Park Service uh, notifying the Forest Service and notifying uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory and, sur and several surrounding landowners, but it didn't go any further than notification. And the point you seem to make is that there should be a consultation, uh, a notification, and a further consultation. And what drives that point home is that on the very day that the National Park Service started the prescribed burn on May the 4th, the Forest Service on adjoining land decided to stop all burning. And, and what it seems to me you're saying is that, that uh, if there had been a further consultation, it may well have been that the Forest Service people would have said the conditions are too dry, it looks like winds are coming up, and, and we may have averted this disaster. Am I correct in, in assuming that, that there needs to be more cooperation with not only federal agencies, but, but uh, state and local and, and private agencies in this process of going through prescribed burns. Absolutely, and not only, not only cooperation and notification, we're also talking about coordination and working together. <clears throat> in this case, every, all the affected parties knew this was a very high risk area. This, this is the reason the prescribed burn was being done to, to minimize or reduce that risk. The, 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 the Park Service, the Forest Service, Na the Los Alamos National Lab and the town of Los Alamos should, should have worked more closely together up front to identify areas that needed to, to be thinned or provide some additional fire breaks in case something went wrong, almost a contingency plan in terms of if that, if that prescribed burn gets out of hand, there's got to be some point we, we have, to, we have, have had, uh, already had to do some work to prevent it from going to the point where it's going to 
burn property and, and, and raise a risk to the, to the lab. And the, the Cerro Grande uh, provides an excellent case study in terms of it actually did occur in, 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 uh, uh, with regard to the Los Alamos, uh, Los Alamos National Lab and the work that they did to do some clearing and thinning in the prior year. That clearing and thinning perhaps really saved the lab from some significant damage. And if, if similar actions would have been done uh, on the Santa Fe National Forest and around the community of Los Alamos, perhaps we could have averted the disaster. Yeah. Th thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Thank you, Mr. Udall. I want to thank you, gentlemen, for, again, uh, your good work. And uh, thank you for being here. And at this time, this panel is excused. <clears throat> well done. They did a good job, didn't they? Now I look forward to uh, calling your governor, the Honorable Gary E. Johnson, governor of the state of New Mexico, and uh, Mr. Tony uh, Toby Martinez, the New Mexico State Forester. Um, governor, this is the second time that you have appeared before us, and it's an honor to have you here again. As explained in our first hearing, it is the intention of this chairman to place all outside witnesses under the oath, and this is a this is a formality of this committee, and I think you've been provided a copy of the committee rules, and so if you would stand and raise your hand to the square. <laughs> Do you promise and affirm under the penalty of perjury that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Thanks. Madam Chairman, uh, members of the subcommittee, uh, you have my written testimony, and in an effort uh, maybe to save a little bit of time here, I would like to kind of summarize that, if that's all right. Without objection, so ordered. Very good. I want to thank Congress, uh, for starters. Uh, $600 million was appropriated uh, to make citizens of Los Alamos whole. Uh, I met with FEMA representatives last week uh, and was assured um, that they're going to do everything that they possibly can to do just that. And uh, that would not be happening if it weren't for Congress. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, you know, when all this, when all this started, uh, fire, fire prevention, uh, healthy forest, ecology, I have to admit, I, thinking maybe I knew a little bit more than what I really knew, uh, I was really naive uh, regarding forest health. Uh, I found out from Secretary Babbitt that, uh, you know, at the turn of the century, smoke, uh, the smell of fire in the West was something that was constant. There was always something burning in the West. Well, for about the last hundred years, uh, we have developed a strategy to put fires out, uh, effectively doing away with that. So what we've got, uh, we've got little trees uh, in the forest, bigger trees, bigger trees, bigger trees, going all the way to the, to the biggest trees in the forest. So when you have a fire like you have in Los Alamos, you have, you have that fire becoming a crown fire very quickly because it can burn from the very lowest level to the tops of the trees. And what you're left with is just moonscape. Uh, to this day, I'm just struck by being able to fly over the Los Alamos fire uh, as, as soon as it was out uh, and being struck by the fact that there was nothing left. There were no big trees uh, left in the forest. I am struck by the fact that standing on the north side of the Los Alamos during the fire, uh, we watched a fire go up the side of a mountainside, my, my wife and myself and others gathered there. And if that would have been in a movie, I would have said, ah, there's no way that a fire could have moved that fast. The point being is today we have fires that go from the ground to the crowns of the trees and destroy entire forests because of what we have done with our forests. So we need to do four things. Uh, number one is we need to increase the funding for fire suppression and prevention activities. And I don't expect that to be just Congress that appropriates that money. Uh, that is something that the state of New Mexico uh, is going to also uh, be asked to appropriate. During the next uh, session of the legislature, I will be asking for those funds uh, that we can take care of these interface areas in New Mexico. It would be great if Congress would also increase its funding. We need to streamline the process that allows for recovery of fire-damaged timber. 
Apparently, we're talking about $15 million worth of timber, at least in New Mexico, that might be removed today, that might have a marketable value today, that might be utilized today. Uh, under present rules, apparently, that might not be able to be done for a year. And to my understanding, if we wait a year, uh, a lot of this timber is just not going to have a value. Thirdly, uh, develop a cohesive, comprehensive strategy to implement uh, fire prevention programs in the urban wildlife interfaced areas most at risk. Now, you point out the plans are in place. Uh, other testimony this morning says, well, maybe all the I's aren't dotted, maybe all the T's aren't crossed. Well, let's dot the I's, let's cross the T's, let's act, not procrastinate, because this is something that has to get done. And then we need to establish a procedure by which local, state, uh, and tribal entities are consulted before finalizing a decision to use uh, prescribed fire. Uh, one more checkoff needs to exist, and we talked about that earlier in Washington. I don't know what the fix is, but I don't think it's very complicated, and one needs to exist. Uh, when, when you've got conditions here in New Mexico that are arguably as dry as they have ever been before, um, prescribed fire m might seem a little bit out of bounds. Thank you very much for allowing me to testify, and I look forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you, Governor, for being with us today. Uh, the Chair recognizes Mr. Martinez for his testimony. <clears throat> Madam Chair, uh, members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about New Mexico's experience as it relates to this subject. First off, just to put it in perspective, uh, New Mexico experienced certainly a precedent-setting uh, year in terms of human suffering with Los Alamos and 20 other communities being evacuated with the largest fire by, by twice as many acres, by twice as many expenditures and money uh, for, uh, for suppression uh, for the state of New Mexico, as well as federal agencies. So it was, it was a terrible season, but it could have been worse. Uh, we had situations where both the Cerro Grande fire could have, in fact, gone 100,000 acres, and those contingencies were, were being evaluated. Uh, we had the Vivash fire that actually travels five, six miles in one day and threatened the watershed of, uh, of Gainas, which is 100%, uh, the community of Las Vegas is 100% dependent on that watershed. So um, in terms of lessons learned, uh, many of the lessons uh, learned in New Mexico are the lessons that, that have been learned in many other Western states in California so forth. Uh, I, I would like to focus on some management uh, uh, things that happened that did make a difference. Uh, earlier in the, in the overview, uh, there was this uh, shared about the thinning along uh, a certain highway. That, in fact, proved the place that firefighters were able to make a stand. Where it was not thin, it crossed the road. There were uh, landowners that were, in fact, doing things that uh, in, their, in their subdivisions that actually saved their homes. Something as simple as raking leaves. But, it, but the biggest lesson to me is the fact that these fires were so ca catastrophic that they exploded so violently and they went so far. So many times we think about protecting the community right next to a community, but these, some of these fires came from many miles away. Uh, so in terms of uh, what can we do, uh, what are the actions, uh, discussions that were, were shared er earlier about a cohesive strategy presented, uh, chaired by Deputy Regional Forester Laverty. In New Mexico, we have presented and shared a 20 community strategy that basically is intuitive in terms of identifying the communities. It does, uh, it, it's based on risk, and, and it is simply a list that we can start dialoguing with folks. Um, it, it, in the end, it, it should be a way that we can get at prioritizing projects and also involving all the stakeholders, and then ultimately collectively uh, funneling our resources to deal with those priorities. I developed, we developed a list and are in the process of sharing it with communities across the state of New Mexico. The response we get is very positive. Uh, it's probably, uh, in terms of risk, a, a, a one that demonstrates a 1 to 20 listing, but in fact, anybody on that list that, that, that is at risk, that is willing to work and do something should be given priority. 
So we look at uh, somehow collectively channeling our resources and dealing with those priorities. We should be picking ultimately projects on both sides of the fence, both on national forest side and on state and private sides. There, for example, the watershed, uh, the Santa Fe watershed shed earlier mentioned, you have to do the interface, which is mostly state and private. Just doing the watershed alone is not enough. So uh, we, we, in the end, I would also like to, to conclude with, with essentially a plea, and that is that uh, as we look at the challenges of watersheds and endangered species and general landscapes, as a minimum, we ought to be able to focus on interface. Madam Chair, it's more than property, it's lives at stake. We have communities in New Mexico that, uh, uh, different than, than Los Alamos that was evacuated in four hours, might not be able to evacuate. So beyond protecting the communities and their property, uh, I think lives are, could be at stake. So in my plea, it's, it's simple, and it's, it's at least to be able to agree on the interface that all the stakeholders, and particularly environmental community, uh, the administration, and the Congress, basically set aside any differences so that land management agencies can, in fact, move forward without any constraints, allow the specialists to identify what's needed, and allow them to move forward and do the work that's, that's called for. Thank you. I Thank you, questions. Mr. Martinez. And uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Udall for his questions. Uh, th thank you uh, very much, Madam Chair. Um, God, let me uh, first of all applaud uh, Governor Johnson for his uh, role in the uh, Cerro Grande uh, fire and the other fires across New Mexico. I know when I came back from Washington after finishing a final vote, uh, he was, uh, he'd already been up there for a day, a day and a half. Uh, he spent uh, many hours uh, up in Los Alamos. Nobody knew at the time what the dangers might be, but I, I think he spent the first couple of nights up there, spending the night up there, probably not sleeping much. And, and uh, rumor had it at one point, he even jumped out of a truck with a shovel and put out a fire in somebody's yard. So, so he, he, uh, he was a real hands-on uh, governor in terms of dealing with this fire, and I, I want to recognize that. Um, I also want to recognize, Governor, in, in our early discussions, you were one of the ones, and you said this in the many press conferences up there, that the federal government should accept responsibility for this after it became very clear from the early briefings that that uh, the federal government was at fault and there was a problem here that we should move on and we should put uh, make people whole and let them put them li put their lives back together so I think you can also share in the 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 accomplishment of within 60 days getting a piece of legislation in place that compensates people we have a FEMA office opening up there and where there should be money flowing out to citizens to help them rebuild their homes and their lives within the next uh, couple of months. So that's something that, that I think all of us are, are very proud of as members of Congress, that we acted very quickly. And I think uh, your involvement in that was greatly appreciated. Uh, Governor, I notice in your, in your statement, uh, you talk about prescribed fire being an important management tool and that it should be retained. What are your thoughts on, on precautions and and actions that should be taken to, you know, if we retain this tool, what do we need to do to make sure that, a, that another uh, uh, Cerro Grande or Scott Abel fire don't occur? Uh, as, as we all heard here this morning, hundreds of controlled uh, burns have been utilized. So this has been an effective tool. Uh, that it uh, did get out of control with this fire, yes it did. Uh, again, if I'm in the chain determining whether or not to set a prescribed burn in New Mexico given that time, uh, I'm thinking I say no, but I'm not going to pretend that I'm smart enough and that I'm going to even be included in that chain. Uh, but at some point, uh, there needs to be another checkoff that perhaps prevents something like this from happening. Great. Thank um, Mr. Martinez, you're the 
the um, state forester, you you deal with how, how many million acres of forests are we talking about that are under the your, the governors in your jurisdiction? State of private lands in New Mexico, and under our responsibility, are 42 million plus. 42 million plus, and what? And uh, are we talking federally about four or five times that? Is that? Uh, in terms of national forests? Yeah, national uh, forests. Uh, approximately. Yeah, okay. So, so with the amount of forests that, that you have under your jurisdiction, it's clear with, with the interjoining uh, national forests that we have a lot of uh, cooperation and, and sharing of, of plans that are to go forward in terms of thinning and prescribed burns and everything else. So how do you feel at this point the relationship is with the the federal government and the federal agencies. I mentioned that uh, New Mexico has a 20 community strategy to <clears throat> prioritize or at least identify the, the, the most uh, at-risk communities. We are in the process of sharing that information and agreeing on criteria and looking at projects that could in fact move forward. Forest Service has some NEPA projects that in fact address some, many of those communities, but there are many that are not covered yet. We intend to move forward to try to address those. And and would you agree? You were, I believe, here earlier when I talked about the Santa Fe watershed situation. That we're talking about uh, a top priority situation when you have a, a a watershed that that if it's destroyed by fire could wipe out 40 percent of the water f supply. I think in in Las Vegas, the city of Las Vegas, it could be 100 percent. So these are the areas that ought to be uh, targeted. I focus my comments on the interface because of life and property, but I also believe that a list or of, of uh, areas for, for watersheds, uh, in particular municipal watersheds, should also be developed and then prioritized, uh, or at least prioritized to bring those attention to those areas. Thank you uh, both for coming today and being with us. Thank you, Mr. Udall. Mrs. Wilson, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Governor, I also wanted to commend you for your leadership during the fire. You were looking pretty hot and sweaty and unshowered. I didn't mention that at the time, but I, I uh, yeah, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, at a point of crisis, crisis, leadership matters. I wanted to publicly commend you for your for your efforts. You mentioned in your testimony that um, that you thought we needed to streamline the process for removing the fire damaged timber. Could you elaborate on that a little more and describe what are the barriers, what's, what's keeping this from going forward? What are the highest hurdles just from, from what you've been seeing and hearing? And maybe Toby better addresses that, but rules in place that, again, prevent the removal of these, of these trees that do have uh, marketable value. What, where, the, Toby, do you, I'm, I'm, do you know what the big, what are the, what's the big hold up here? Madam Chair, in, in my opinion, it is basically getting through all the requirements that are called for by NEPA. The, the Sorry, inventories, the getting through that process, the, the federal agencies must, must comply, and I wouldn't comply with the law, and I wouldn't expect them not to. But somehow, there, ha there ought to be a way of moving through those requirements much, much faster. So the, in order to take out the damaged trees after a forest fire, you have to go through, you, ha you have to do a, an environmental assessment under NEPA? That's correct. Um, Governor, were you notified, or was it, were, or, or maybe, uh, Mr. Martinez, were you notified about the fire? And are, is there a standard process for notification of state and local government on prescribed burns? To my knowledge, there was no notification uh, to the state before this. That's correct. There was no notification. I find that interesting, given that it is required in federal regulations to lo to notify. Uh, state and local government, and we put that in as a as a condition of using next year's federal funds that they must comply with our own policies and procedures with respect to notification. And, and I'm sure that if that somehow after the first of October doesn't occur, that uh, that we'll know about that. And I appreciate it if you let me know if there are prescribed burns going on and state and local government is not being notified. Because that would, uh, if the appropriations bills pass, with an amendment that Mr. Udall and I put in, uh, that uh, that uh, 
that would be contrary to federal law, and we'd like to know about that. Could I ask a question? Uh, just recently, they, there was a controlled burn uh, near Cloudcroft, and uh, I read it in the paper. Uh, was that, was that in fact, uh, not were we notified as a state? Again, to my knowledge, talking to my folks, there was no notification. Uh, Seems though we, we need to clear up some of those things too, and I appreciate your letting us know whether anything gets better or whether it stays the same, because it's that's been a big problem not only here but elsewhere. And I, uh, th there's one other thing with my remaining time, Mr. Martinez, I wanted you to talk about a little bit. You talked about the 20 priority communities. Can you give a sense in terms of acres or man years or whatever, however you measure those things, of a uh, uh, how big a task it will be to uh, to make those parts of the forest safer around those communities? Madam Chair, we were focusing on, on communities at risk and have not gone the next step, which really would be implementation of specifically identifying acreages. But just to, to try to arrive at, at an estimate, we've, we estimated that there would be around 40,000 acres in those communities combined that would need to be treated. When you, I know you have an a interesting program, a cooperation, cooperative program with the Department of Corrections, and of course there's also Camp Sierra Blanca down in the, the Lincoln, or near the Lincoln Forest. When they go in to do clearing and, and forest maintenance, how, how, in, how labor intensive is this? And is there, a, is there a way for state agencies and the federal government to be cooperating and taking some young people into the forest, teaching them some skills, and having them give back to the community. I, I just have to believe that there are those opportunities. I mean, this is a this is a perfect opportunity to utilize just uh, that manpower that you're talking about, kids and uh, correctional uh, individuals. I look forward to working with you on that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, <clears throat> Mrs. Wilson. Governor, you, you thank the Congress for uh, loosening up $600 million uh, for mop-up and, um, and repair and also to, uh, for restitution. And in large part, the reason that $600 million flowed was because of Chairman Joe Skeen. This money, uh, of course, comes from his committee. He is the chairman, subcommittee chairman on, uh, on agriculture. Also, it comes from the Subcommittee on Interior. And I want to thank uh, Chairman Skeen and his, and his staff for their good work uh, during this very critical time for this state. And with that, I'd like to recognize Chairman Skeen for his questions. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. <laughs> and uh, Governor, what are other governors telling you about problems with the fires and, and forest measures? Is, is this a topic that... Uh, of importance to you. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, it's affecting all the West, as all of you uh, realize, and uh, that points out the plus, too, of uh, the fires that occurred in New Mexico. We were really the first of the fires to occur, so all the resources were available here. Right now, there's a stretch of resources throughout the West. That's the concern right now amongst governors, is if the fires get any worse from this point, the resources are just stretched to the max. How would a more formal role for state government to, to improve the management of, of the forest? Uh, or, or is there any interest in doing that? To yeah, I think there, there's absolute interest uh, by the state of New Mexico to co cooperate and see that uh, occur. I mean, we'll, I'll, I'll pledge that today. Thank you. I really appreciate that because I think that's something we've overlooked for a long, long time. <coughs> we used to have that kind of response for young people uh, to do the forestry. And they were raised in it and understood it. And uh, we let it go for too long. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Skeen. Governor, you know, this, this may be a bit embarrassing to, uh, to Mr. Martinez, but I want you to know that you've done an extraordinarily good job in, in maintaining Mr. Martinez as your state forester. His reputation, of course, precedes his presence here. He's regarded as one of the nation's best foresters. And uh, I appreciate and respect his good work, and I thank you. Um, governor, this, you are governor of a state that is so rich in tradition and, and culture and, and heritage. Even as I've had the opportunity to travel 
uh, overseas. The Western culture and, and traditions are highly regarded in Europe and all over the world. It's something that, that happened because of the nature of the people that settled the West. Um, their, their, uh, their backgrounds, uh, their genetic makeup, uh, and so mm -hmm. forth. It's unusual. And I love being from the West because of our traditions and our culture and heritage. And no amount of government rules and regulations could ever duplicate that. But there seemed to come, especially in 1984, um, well, no, I, I'd have to say beginning in the, in the 70s, a real war on the West, a real war on our traditional culture and heritage, that heritage that's reflected in Washington, D.C., and too many doggone pickups back there in that crowded area, <laughs> people dressing like they do out here in New Mexico, people having art, people emulating the songs and the lifestyle, and yet we're, we're destroying through a new uh, movement, destroying this very culture and heritage that we're so proud of. Uh, Governor, in, in large part, as Teddy Roosevelt uh, envisioned the management of the national forest grazing was part of his vision um, be, because it kept the fuel load reduced down. <clears throat> I'd much rather see sh sheep and cattle uh, grazing than I would see the moonscape that you referred to. Uh, and as I speak with people across the nation, they are very interested in seeing that restored. Um, as I study, Governor, um, the settlement of the West and understand that that except for the special Spanish land grants that certain areas of your state were set aside in, most all of the rest of the state have, outside of the fee simple land, the fee land, have private property rights in their allotments. That is to say that the courts historically have ruled that the ranchers actually own the water, the, uh, the ditch rights and uh, the forage that grows on the allotments, uh, whether it's in the forest land or, or in land managed by interior. And so the destruction that comes about as a result of, of the mismanagement uh, of these lands is, <coughs> is so destructive to private property rights. Um, Again, without regards to party affiliations, it's my hope that in the future we can all join together to really bring out in the future the very best, naturally the best, of our Western heritage and our culture. And I don't think that we can overlook the value of grazing or overlook those private property use rights appurtenant to the, to the land that uh, the American people have trusted the, the government to in part manage. Um, you mentioned the moonscape created by these fires. Uh, as you know, these moonscapes are created uh, by the intense uh, temperature of the fire as it burns into the soil and changes the soil composition. Then whole watersheds have been um, destabilized. Uh, what assistance are you receiving from the federal government to, to uh, rehabilitate these entire watersheds? and to, uh, to somehow restore the soils. Again, t to my knowledge, uh, all of the resources that can be made available are available. So this rehabilitation is taking place to the, to the best uh, possible measure. Um, is it ever going to uh, replace what has been destroyed? Uh, no, but uh, this has not been a lack of resource uh, after the fact. Now, Toby may, may elaborate on that. Mr. Martinez? That is correct. The, uh, through the resources uh, coming through FEMA, uh, many of the requ uh, required rehabilitation that is needed on the land is occurring. Mr. Martinez, I want to ask as my last question, would it make sense to you uh, to impose a 12 uh, on hazardous fuels reduction activities on all federal lands uh, in your state, in your opinion? There are some stands, you know, that are homogeneous where you might find timber under 12 inches that, that might be appropriate to, to deal with cutting under 12 inches. But in general, that would not do the job. Uh, 
Uh, in particular, I reflect on situations where you have draws that, that have bigger trees that are basically the, the uh, place where fires will funnel into communities. You'll have laddering fuels and horizontal fuels, and it'll usually occur in bigger trees. You would certainly not have uh, addressed that. I think that it, there are not, not to be any limits set. There ought to be uh, a focus on allowing the agencies and the specialists to address what's needed. Uh, find out what's needed from an ecological human perspective and allow those treatments to occur. I have many, many more questions I'd like to ask you, but um, we're limited by time, too. And uh, I would like to submit more questions to you in writing. I want to thank you very much for being here. And, Governor, you are so lucky to have the position of being governor over this great state. I, uh, I am envious. Uh, it is, uh, it is a wonderful uh, ability to be able to govern the, these unique people in this very beautiful state. Thank you very much Thanks. for being Thank you. here. I'd like to uh, call panel three to the witness stand. Mr. Mike, Mike Nivison, uh, Cloudcroft Village Administrator from the Village of Cloudcroft. Mr. Allen uh, Savory, Director of the Savory Center, and Mr. Phil, uh, Paul Souter, uh, Private Citizen, Mr. Uh, Larry Delgado, uh, Mayor of, the, uh, of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, as these gentlemen are taking their seat, <clears throat> I want to say that these hearings are no easy task to put on. It takes a lot of cooperation uh, between our Washington staffs and our Idaho and our New Mexico staffs here. And at this point in time, I'd like to uh, introduce those staff members who are with their members and who have assisted us so greatly in putting this hearing on. And I'd like them to stand and be recognized as I uh, call out their names. Uh, Kristen Astor from Mrs. Wilson's staff. Kristen, where are you? Over here. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, Carlos Guerrero from Mr. Carlos. Udall's staff. Carlos is here. Jim Hughes from uh, Mr. Wilson or Mr. Skeen's staff. Mr. Hughes, thank you. And Andy Gillespie, who is from uh, my committee staff, is here. Over here, I lost track of you, Andy. Uh, Mike Twincheck, who is our clerk of the committee here from Washington, D.C., also. And Doug Crandall, who is director uh, of our committee, is here. I also want to thank uh, Kathy Townsend, uh, the hearing recorder, who is, who is here with us today. Uh, Deborah Martinez is here. And uh, from, from Mr. Udall's staff. Deborah, where are you? Back here. And uh, Gerald uh, Gonzalez is also here from Mr. Udall's staff. Gerald, there you are. Thank you for your good work. I think I've got another one from Bill White. And uh, Bill White is here from Mr. Udall's staff. Bill, will you please stand and be recognized? Where are you, Bill? There he is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your good work. I, uh, I want to say, gentlemen, that I think we have provided you a copy of the committee rules uh, with regards to uh, how the hearing is conducted. One thing that I want to call your attention to is you may have noticed these lights up here. Just think of them like traffic lights and you're driving through your testimony. Uh, green means go, but uh, yellow means step on it. And, uh, <laughs> and red means stop. Uh, another thing, I think you've been provided with a copy of the, uh, of the subcommittee rules, and that is that the chairman places all outside witnesses under the oath. So if you would stand and raise your hand to the square. Do you promise and affirm under the penalty of perjury that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you. And it's good to see you again. Thank you for being here, and we welcome your testimony. Nice to see you, Madam Chairman, and members of the committee. And thank you for inviting us. Uh, I, I want to read some of my uh, testimony here. Uh, you should all have a copy. Um, I want to know that this testimony is not directed at the Forest Service personnel or the courageous firefighters. Uh, 
I spent 12 years in the fire service myself. But those uh, in decision-making positions, either unwilling to stand for the truth or who are driving agendas. Uh, we do believe in the American system of checks and balances in Otero County. And I think in the past, uh, sometimes the counties have been remiss in not coming to the table. Uh, due to the fact that uh, the government at one time was uh, our benevolent father. Mm -hmm. And I think that view has, has changed in the eyes of uh, rural America. Uh, most of the time in the past, uh, the staffing was done on a local level, who was aware of local, local custom and cultures. I don't think we can paint this, uh, these issues with a big paintbrush. Uh, I think they have to be generated through the participation of the Forest Service, the state, and the counties as a well-balanced approach. Uh, this government that I'm speaking of uh, in the recent future is one that I don't think our forefathers envisioned. And it seems to be dictating from afar and subject to, uh, subjecting the West to its rod, no matter what the outcries or results. And some of the agendas that I'd like to identify, roadless areas, which will end logging in the Southwest forest and in, uh, inhibit the ability to fight catastrophic fires, con uh, con conservation easements, which rob our tax base without consent or approval of local officials, water regulations that are being amended when in fact they're, they're being rewritten, um, Forest Service uh, 2540 rules, Clean Water Initiative. Uh, I believe those are state sovereign issues and they're being, are trying to be controlled by the tentacles from afar. And I believe these are, are state sovereign issues that we need to get a ha handle on. Decoupling of timber sales so that we become welfare recipients of the government instead of a vigorous local economies with forest related jobs. Uh, urban interface, uh, I think it's a good thing, but I believe it's only a band aid. It doesn't bring economy because it's only thinning. We do not have an economy for small diameter timber. Uh, it looks good, it's paid for the taxpayer, and it's addressing the symptoms instead of the problem. It's money taken from the taxpayer's pocket instead of money generated from timber harvest. Inability of the uh, Forest Service to uh, harvest the Scott Abel fire. I don't believe that's going to happen in a timely fashion. The last bridge fire that we had didn't happen. It was another owl-related fire, if I'm correct. Uh, at, we've had some problems after the flood, uh, with the floods after the fire. Uh, who is culpable for this? We've argued over that. Uh, I know there was a great amount of relief for Los Alamos, but we don't see that on the Scott Abel fire. Uh, I guess we are going to be argu arguing over the culpability of that. As recent as Friday, I had one of my flood victims call and say they had been denied uh, uh, FEMA funds because they didn't fall in the time frame of the emergency. When they called Washington, they were told uh, that they couldn't, and did they have any appeal process? Get a lawyer. That's what they were told from the Washington office. The question needs to be asked when the government controls or owns all the resources in the country, will we still need people? Or will the government still need people? <laughs> will the people have lost their place in government, and does this break the sacred trust afforded us in the Constitution, and more importantly, the declaration declaration of independence that guarantees us those rights not from our government but from our creator. The decision is not hard or question in rural communities now. We pray a lot these days. Um, I believe that uh, our mill uh, closed last week uh, on the hills of a 14 percent uh, decline in gross receipts in the community last year. Uh, we if we harvest timber, where do you take it? We must save or bring back this mill. Plans like the Spotted Owl Recovery Plan, thinning nine inches in diameter is acceptable. Isn't it coincidental that the mill can only take nine inches in diameter up? Grazing issues have the same thing. 
the vole mouse, you cannot reach the stubble height on the ground. I submit to you that we are being held hostage by foreign oil now, and after the destruction of rural America, we will probably be held hostage for our food and our natural resources. What are the desired future conditions? I, I think the National Environmental Policy Act, reformation of the Endangered Species, Clean Water Act, and um, I would just say that God is our commander. You are our leaders. We are your soldiers. Show us the way, and we will be there. God bless. Thank you. Mr. Savory, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for asking me to testify today. I've given written testimony. I want to address four areas of this problem. The first is you mentioned earlier birth, growth, and death. You missed the fourth one, Madam Chair, decay. The key to this whole problem of why our forests are becoming drier and more combustion is decay. This is oxidation. This is plant material that is 10 to 20 years old. This grass plant died 10 years or more ago. This is biological decay. This will ignite immediately with a match. This you cannot burn. We have converted our rangelands, our forests of the West, from biological rapid decay to slow physical weathering and chemical oxidation. It is very easy, profoundly simple, to understand this and reverse that procedure. Now, this is linked to two other problems that are in my written testimony. Throughout history, poor and deteriorating, desertifying land has led to poverty, social breakdown, increase in violence, crime, eventually to genocide, war, and the failure of civilizations. We have the greatest concentration of scientists ever known in any nation in the history of the world. Eroding soil is now outweighing all American exports annually. This is not just a Forest Service problem. It is much deeper. The conflict that we're seeing in our rural communities, the dying of our rural communities, it's been happening for 10,000 years. It's not new. It is profoundly simple to address it with new knowledge that is available. That brings me to the fourth problem. I've mentioned the first two are profoundly simple to deal with, but they're not easy. They're not easy because of the fourth problem, and that is how do you get new knowledge into democratic societies where everything is run by bureaucracy? The bureaucracy of environmental organizations, the bureaucracy of livestock organizations, the bureaucracies that our universities have become, as well as our government bureaucracies. It takes from 100 to 200 years to get new knowledge into democratic societies. Lord Ashby, who's probably the foremost authority on this, gave three lectures, the Leon Sloss series of lectures at Stanford, from, based on his research. He looked at Britain and America over the last 200 years to see how do you get new knowledge into societies. He found that it is just simply not possible other than through grassroots. And only when people in the pub, at the sports field, the school grounds are saying, when is the government going to do something? Is it safe for the government to move or the bureaucracies to move of any of our institutions. So in my written constitution, I happen not to agree with Lord Ashby, who says it has to take 200 years. I have made a suggestion that short, could short circuit this for us in this country in view of the seriousness of the problem. Throughout all the testimony, only two tools have been mentioned to restore health to our forests. Those have involved tool of technology, machinery, chemical, fire retardants, etc., and the tool of fire. It is total scientific impossibility to convert oxidation and physical weathering to biological decay with any technology in the world or fire. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Savory. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Souder. <clears throat> I happen to know someone in Heather's Albuquerque office that knows that I live in the East Mountains and have a brushy hillside. Uh, I've spent the last two years uh, with my chainsaw clearing, trying to avoid what uh, someday could happen to us, and that's a fire to wipe us off the hill. I built my own home up on top of a hill big effort over 25 years. 
my family and I are, have been users of the forest, uh, skiers, hikers, bicycle riders, and so forth, uh, for 40 years that I've lived out there. From our house, we have a wonderful view of the South Sandia Mountains, which is almost all designated as wilderness. I personally am located at about 7,000 foot elevation. My vegetation is pinyon and juniper trees. From the beginning of being out there, I must admit I've had the smoky bear mentality. The trees are precious, they grow slow, boy, you better protect them. Well, it turns out that we've had some wet years and I've owned my property for 40 years. It got to the point you couldn't even see through the trees. You couldn't walk through it. It was a jungle. Juniper and pinion. Several years ago, we had the uh, serious fire up around Cuesta and Red River that got me thinking about my own situation. As I understood how that fire started, it was a guy burning trash uh, in the low country, uh, juniper and pinion and grass that got out of control. And it was very dry. That spring, and I think it was four years ago, uh, we had a really dry year. Uh, the forest was closed. The uh, local uh, sheriff's substation had a bulldozer sitting on a flatbed in preparation in case we did have a fire. Uh, I had the local fire chief come up and look at my situation, and he sort of shook his head and he said, there's no way we're going to come fight this if it's a wildfire. There's just no way to stop it. He said, your thought better be evacuation in the short term, and in the long term, think about thinning. Well, two years ago, we had another dry spring, and I still hadn't started thinning. I bought a new chainsaw, and I practically wore the sucker out. <laughs> uh, I'm still only about half done. I've got two, two men that helped me. Uh, it is a really a labor-intensive project. I've got some pictures there in a, a notebook, at, uh, I think uh, in front of Mrs. Wilson, uh, that show my hillside before it was thinned, after it's thinned. Uh, I think it looks a whole lot better, but uh, I still worry about it burning. Without objection, Mr. Souter, we'd like to enter those into the record. I think that's what I intended. <laughs> The same problem that exists in my place exists all over the East Mountains. It's not just on private land. Uh, the forest is dense with uh, trees. Some are down. There's pictures in there north of the ski area. Uh, it, it's a jungle. Uh, if you used to play the old game of pickup sticks, uh, it's pickup sticks with trees. Uh, there are huge trees. There's little trees. There's nothing growing on the ground. Uh, there's no grass because the sun doesn't get through to the ground. People talk like it's not a question of if it's going to burn, it's when it's going to burn. You know, one of these days, that East Mountain is going to catch on fire, and it's, it's serious. As bad as it is in the private land and in the forest, uh, it's worse in the wilderness. A lot of the East Mountain is a wilderness designated area. There's no roads. Uh, there's no fire breaks. Uh, there's been no wood taken out of that area that I know of forever because there's no roads up in there. Uh, my personal feeling is that having that as a wilderness within a metropolitan area is a real serious mistake. Albuquerque is growing. The East Mountains is growing. Uh, the recreation area that exists in the available Sandia and Manzano area is limited. Uh, I think that the wilderness area could be used as a recreation area if there were roads in it. If there was ever a fire up there, right now they'd have no way of getting equipment up there to fight the fire. There are no roads, there's no fire breaks, that fire would just go to the top of the mountain. That is a watershed for those of us that have wells out there. I, I'm sure that that's where our water comes from. The, fire the, the flood concerns that we have up at Los Alamos it would be the same thing on the East Mountains if that burned. 
So my thought is, uh, I think it's great what the Forest Service is doing to try to construct fire breaks, uh, like in the Manzanos, where I, I, I see this being done. Uh, I've had good luck uh, constructive help from the Forest Service people in uh, how to approach my problem. I think the county of Bernalillo County has done a great job with their transfer station out here in the East Mountains, providing a place for us to get rid of this brush. And here's an article about a fair amount of money that's recently been spent to, uh, to buy a big chipper, which I'd like to also enter into the uh, record here. Without objection, so ordered. Okay. Anyway, my thought is that uh, if that continues as a wilderness, uh, one of these days it's going to burn and there's going to be no way to fight it. We'll just sit there and watch it and then suffer the consequences like they are at Los Alamos. That's what I wanted to talk about. Mr. Souter and gentlemen, I want to thank you all for your very fine testimony, very instructive. Appreciate your being here very much. Um, at this time, I'd like to recognize Mr. Udall for his questions. Thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Chair. I, I'd like to uh, address a question here to uh, uh, Mr. Savory. Um, Mr. Savory, I know that you've been involved in the political arena as a member of parliament and also uh, as a leader of your political party in your, your, uh, your native country. And then you've also been very active here in Albuquerque and across the country in working with uh, a variety of organizations to restore the land and bring back the land and, and uh, have healthy forests. And what yeah, one of your ideas you mentioned in your testimony is the idea of setting up a national learning site so that people can share ideas and you have some collaborative learning. T tell us a little bit about that and how you've been working on that and what uh, any suggestions you might have for how we could help on that. Yes, this is the central theme of my um, suggestion is because it takes 100 to 200 years, as I said, to get through the minefield of institutional egos, personal egos, legitimate different opinions, arguments, the things that go on in our committees and our societies, <clears throat> and not wanting to accept that, that we have to always go through that. You're probably all aware it took the Royal Navy 200 years to accept that lemon juice would end scurvy, led by brilliant men in a bureaucracy, and it took the um, Merchant Navy a further 70 years. We have known that overgrazing has got nothing to do with animal numbers for 50 years. It's not accepted by a single university, single livestock organization, a single government agency in the world yet. <coughs> nothing has changed. This is the way bureaucracies function. And so what I'm suggesting is that we take a large area of the United States that is bad, it can be the worst in the country, it doesn't matter, and we there bring all the contesting parties together, the government agencies, the environmental organizations together, and we use a new framework to just make the decisions so that you heed new knowledge, new science. At the moment, we're working on myths and stuff that is scientifically out of date by 50 and more years. So you use the knowledge that's available to our forest service, in our communities, in the public, etc., through a new framework. There is hardly a reputable scientist today not saying that we need to be managing more holistically, thinking more holistically. For 45 years of my life, I've been working on how do you do that. It's easy to say that in theory, and I have written a textbook on how that can be done. And we train people worldwide on how to do that. So we could do that very easily in this country. It has the advantage that it brings even old enemies together it gets through all the fights and arguments because there's not a person in this room that doesn't want more prosperity, more stability, more family life, more freedom to pursue their own spiritual values, religions. We all want the same thing. But because of the way we formulate policies and make decisions today, we get into endless arguments of fire, no fire, mechanical treatment versus thinning, versus that, that and the other, while our communities get into more conflicts, more poverty, etc. So I'm just suggesting a short way through that. To cost uh, it, or to what it would cost, it'd probably cost a million or two to do. To not do it will cost this country trillions of dollars. You, you talk about the, the 
that overgrazing isn't numbers of animals. What, what is the science behind that, and what is the, the I, I notice you quote a scientist in here that talks about uh, time versus numbers, and, and mm. could you allude on that a little bit for yes. us? Yes. Andre Ozan, the scientist I'm quoting there, is a Frenchman. He was the first to discover that where we had thought for more than 2,000 years that if you're getting overgrazing occurring, you have too many livestock. You can go back to ancient Hebrew texts, and they were blaming the nomads for forming the deserts, too many livestock. Uh, what he discovered was, no, it's got everything to do with the number of, uh, the amount of time that a plant is exposed to the animals and when it's re-exposed. And it doesn't matter whether there's one cow there or a million. Yeah, that's got nothing to do with overgrazing. And this uh, d decay turning to oxidation, from decay to oxidation, is because of the absence of animals on the land. Decay is a biological process, and the microorganisms that bring it about when the season dries off all drop off in population except in the stomachs of large animals, where it's still moist. The large animals cannot digest this plant material. They do it in a symbiosis with the microorganisms in their stomach. And that's what maintains the biological decay process. The problem we're talking about in our forests today didn't start in the last 100 years. It started roughly nine to 10,000 years ago, when 74% of the genera of animals were killed off on this continent. And they've been decreasing ever since. And, and you're, you, what you're seeing when you talk about the science and, and is that it's the interrelationship between uh, animals and the land and that, that cultivate a, a healthy environment. Yes, that's what cultivates this and did in the past was an interrelationships. Plants, soils, microorganisms and animals co-evolved together. You didn't get plants before you got animals or vice versa. They co-evolved together, and we have broken that pattern. Now, what our new understanding is, is that we did as well as our cultures. So now, today, my, believing, uh, my belief as a scientist is that actually land is not manageable. It is so bound to the culture of the people in the communities and to the local economies that only land people, their culture and economy are manageable. And that's what we would bring about if my suggestion was accepted of a national learning site. We'd bring people together on that basis. And, and a national learning site would give you the ability to, to bring everybody in and have them put their knowledge on the table and experiment and, and move forward, try to break through some of these barriers and maybe get at a place where there's newer knowledge that bureaucracies can then apply. And I noticed that you have you have, uh, you've been doing that here in New Mexico. There's an area mentioned up in, in Idaho in the Lost River Valley on the Salmon uh, Chalice National Forest. And, and Madam Chair, uh, I think this is an important area and, and look forward to maybe working with you on this to see if we can do something that, that uh, could move our knowledge forward a little bit. Thank you, Mr. Saver. Thank you. Th thank thank, thank you, you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Udall. And the Chair recognizes Mrs. Wilson for her questions. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Savory, I have to I have to smile when you talk about the Royal Navy and, and accepting that lime juice can cure scurvy. I think it was probably it definitely was over seventy years ago when, when Billy Mitchell sunk a ship with an airplane and there are still folks in the Navy who don't believe it. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, I wanted to direct some of my questions to Mr. Souter, particularly the situation in the East Mountains and the, the interface between the forest and the and the community there. Is there any way in, uh, uh, under the rules that protect the wilderness and the national forest for people from the community? I noticed in the pictures you showed a lot of dead and down trees, and you showed the huge pile of uh, uh, firewood that you've been able to harvest off your own land as you thinned. Is there any way for people in the community to be able to take some of the down trees out of the forest for, for fuel for, for their homes, or is that just not possible under the rules in the East Mountains? In the forest, uh, there are times that uh, they sell uh, wood harvesting permits, and where there are roads, uh, people will go with their pickups and cut firewood, and, and wood that's uh, usable that gets cleared out. Uh, in the wilderness, that's not the case at all because you can't get in there with a vehicle 
nor can you go in there with a chainsaw. Mm -hmm. And nobody's going to work as so hard, you know, with a wheelbarrow and a handsaw to, to get a little bit of firewood. <laughs> so uh, in, in the forest, it does happen. Now, there are times that uh, for years I have cut wood for my personal use in the forest, and it seems as if it gets progressively difficult to get even that kind of a permit. Uh, I don't understand why this is, but... Uh, why is it? Uh, you say you don't understand why this is. is it just, does that seem to be a local thing that, that varies from... But as well, to who most of those pictures that I have there are in the forest. They're not in the wilderness. And those trees, uh, the roads have locked gates. You can't get there to cut. Uh, it has not been opened up to cutting. Uh, where I do my cutting is near the ski area. Uh, and some of the pictures show an area that had been sort of thinned by trees blowing down and Folks like me gathering the wood, it's, uh, it's green on the ground and the trees are reasonably spaced. Uh, you said it, it's getting, it seems to be getting harder to get a permit to do that kind of... It happens more and more seldom that they open the forest up for wood cutting and there's more and more places where you cannot go because there's locked gates. Now in the, in the wilderness area, you know, you can't do it at all. That's really part of my point is that area has never been open to this kind of activity. And that's where I think it's the worst condition. Has anyone ever explained why they're not allowing it to, as much as they used to in the forest part? I understand the wilderness hasn't been ever allowed, but is, is anyone I've ever... sort of assumed that it's just because there's so many of us and there's a limited amount of uh, places where you can get to. Uh, I know out in the Manzanos there is uh, it, there are areas that uh, they've been consciously trying to thin. Uh, they have wood cutting permits available. Uh, I'm, I'm just not in a position to answer the question. Is, uh, from your experience, is it, uh, in being up and around there and on your bike and hiking and, and riding horses for 40 some odd years, if, <laughs> if there were, uh, if there were, is it physically possible to, if the if the Forest Service or the the, the uh, management agencies decided that they needed to get some of this these down trees out of the wilderness area, and they could get rid of the bureaucratic obstacles, is it physically possible for for to to have wood cutting permits to go in there to to take out some of that? In the wilderness, uh, if it remains a wilderness, you can't put a road in, and without a road, nobody's going to be able to do it. Okay. So, you know, there's no fire breaks, uh, there's no roads, uh, there's just basically no access. They're just hiking trails, uh, and the people that uh, keep those trails open, you know, do it with hand saws. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Wilson. Mr. Skeen, you're recognized for questions. Well, Mr. Nelson, uh, what's happened in the Lincoln Forest during the past three months uh, since the fire? Oh. Congressman, uh, what I understand is that uh, in the first two months, uh, an attempt was to go out to bid for a contractor to do an environmental assessment so that uh, we could possibly harvest those trees. All these, all these problems, too, I think, uh, they can't be dealt with by the Forest Service alone. They're going to have to be done with a, a partnership with privatization. Uh, through these independent companies. And the thinning is, is fine, but when you talk about that small diameter thinning, again, it's labor intensive. There is no market for it in most places. And uh, until they, they hook that up with, with a harvest so that a contractor can go in there and, uh, and balance that, uh, then I don't see our, our problem really resolving itself. Do you have any problems with the Mescaleros? Uh, no. Um, I've often wondered what they think living next to us in the Lincoln when they've done such a fine job in taking care of their uh, forest over there. It's, it's a great lesson. Uh, I know that the forest runs right up to the east edge of yes. Cloud Craw. And, uh, and that was done in a very timely fashion. Uh, I think that took them approximately seven or eight years to attain those results. 
but they've certainly been pro profitable and have a good example. It's a very, very right. proactive. Uh, I, I think we over on the Lincoln field that we're in that uh, no management uh, area right now. I introduced legislation to reorganize the U.S. Uh, Forest Service along the lines of the, uh, of the BLM with state offices, replacing the uh, Forest Service regional offices. I think this would make them uh, more responsive to people that are already impacted by Forest Service management. And do you think that the uh, type of action might be of any help? Um, I do know one thing. We cannot um, exist under the present form. The, the form that got us there is is not, not going to, it's not working, and it's not going to work on the continued path. Um, I, in my testimony earlier, you know, the National Environmental Policy Act says that uh, other federal, state, and local agencies. And I think uh, we, we have had to fight for our place at the table. We get turned down regularly on being a joint lead agency or cooperating agency on an environmental assessment. Even when we are, I don't think that our imp input is really taken to heart. Uh, we've had some pretty good battles, uh, for instance, the uh, standards on guidelines in grazing. Um, I think, too, that big paintbrush where you try to paint the whole United States with one, with one paintbrush doesn't work. We need to sit down and come up with a form, and I think the checks and balances with the federal government, the, the state, and the county would be good. Along with the specific problems that you have to deal with so that you got some... Right. Some Local specific problems where we actually have some authority in the... or, or some positive input that is taken to heart and used in the, in the decision-making process. Thank you very much for your response. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Skeen. <clears throat> Mr. Nivison, I was uh, interested in knowing, do you feel that uh, in your area you are currently at risk uh, for another Los Alamos type fire um, due to the uh, existing uh, conditions there? Is it? Uh, most definitely. Uh, again, I spent 12 years on the fire department in San Diego and uh, did quite a bit of wildland fires out there. Uh, we, we, as you all well know, have been pleading for uh, some remediation in the problem prior to the fire even occurring. Uh, the fire load, uh, and I, I think you can tie this somewhat to the Endangered Species Act because when you see the regulations for the spotted owl clicking in, you, and you'll see it in New Mexico State's report, the harvest went down to where this state uh, totally with that 25 cent money that we get for schools and roads has probably gone down about two million dollars in the Lincoln alone uh, <laughs> about hundred and eleven thousand dollars and we need that money for our roads and schools and uh, so when the when the spotted owl came in the actual accumulation because of the lack of harvesting it exponentially went up uh, to a point where you can hardly walk through our forest now. Interesting. In, in your testimony and in your comments, you mentioned the impacts of NEPA. And I find it very interesting as we study NEPA and the resulting uh, U.S. Supreme Court decisions, the courts have over and over again stated that requirements under NEPA are not only for the agencies to do a study of the results of their agency decisions and to come up with the impact environmentally as well as economically to their agency decisions. But we have seen these agencies move so far as to say it's incumbent upon the private landowners to do whole NEPA studies. It's incumbent upon uh, our cattlemen to do require a whole EIS before their grazing permits are renewed. And yet, I have yet to see um, a NEPA study done on prescribed fires. Now talk about impact, impact of their decision making on uh, the economy and the environment. Uh, I am sorry, but uh, these agencies have totally torqued this law out of what uh, 
um, Mr. Udall's father and various other people had envisioned for this nation when they implemented NEPA. And I thought when I was working as a private uh, consultant that I would rue the day that I would ever uh, say that NEPA was a good thing. But NEPA is a good thing as I study it because it was, it was fashioned to constrain the agencies in their decision making. We would not have had the Los Alamos type fire had the agency com uh, complied with NEPA. So uh, it, it seems as though people now want to do away with NEPA, but I think it's because the agencies have shifted the burden to, um, to the private sector in which uh, the, the courts have ruled that is not the responsibility of the private sectors, but is the responsibility of the agencies. I want to say, Mr. Nivison, that I have been in your area. I have been a visitor and a guest in your area. I am going there tomorrow again. And uh, I love the area of Cloudcroft, and I just uh, hope that we don't see another Los Alamos there. But I have personally witnessed what you have testified to. Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, may I make a comment on the NEPA? Yes. Um, I, I think NEPA is a good law. I think that. Uh, the only way it's going to work, again, to reiterate, is that if there is equal input considered from the local elected officials. Uh, uh, we, we have been get brushed off as far as cooperating agents and joint lead agency. Uh, th at the end of the day, when you get through with the NEPA, it's what the agency wants in the document, what not what the local community wants in the document. On the other hand, the Endangered Species Act, I, I don't think is a good law. Uh, I think it has good points, but for one, the, uh, the citizen suit provision in there is able to bring a state, a county, an individual to their knees without recourse. Uh, we, we find that there is no way we compete, can compete even if we take exception with the federal government in a lawsuit. Um, I agree. Uh, the courts have ruled uh, under uh, U.S. v. Morton that, uh, again, that it is the responsibility of the agencies and they are required to consult with you and to take your, your advice um, very, very seriously. And that's not happening and I share your frustration. Mr. Savory, I was not only very intrigued with your testimony, but also with your, um, with all the experience that you have had, as well as that accent. Uh, I really enjoyed your testimony, and and I do feel that today we are we are further than on the brink of freeing up the individuals in the grassroots, uh, and and moving away from the institutional um, holding of knowledge because through the internet, people are now realizing that they don't have to rely upon, say, the Congress to understand laws or bills that are up, and, and it's on the net. Uh, that's just one small s segment, and I think that uh, we have had a technological breakthrough that um, may do exactly what you have testified to, uh, and that is free up uh, the, the vast amount of understanding uh, that's out here in the grassroots that too often has been ignored. Um, I commend you for your vision. I also feel uh, that the institutional and intuitive knowledge that is held in, in people who live in certain areas and who can glean the information from neighbors and relatives that they have grown up with, uh, I so respect that. And, uh, and I, uh, I thank you for being a part of the panel and for the very interesting testimony that you have uh, offered. I would also be interested in, in studying any the papers that you have published. And so would you, uh, would you mind getting those to me personally? I will do, Madam, may I comment? The local knowledge is so vital that I would just remind you that we had nothing but organic agriculture that destroyed 20 civilizations. We had no pollutants, no machinery, none of the fires we're talking of today. The problem is much deeper than we are able to consider in the time here today. But I will see that you get information. And the internet is helping enormously. But unless we take some other measures to bring people together and address the root causes, 
in the manner I suggest, I think we will be in for many years of worse fires. And so, but I'll certainly get the information to you. Thank you. And just one very last uh, question to Mr. Souter. You testified, Mr. Souter, that the agency has recommended to private landowners that they that they thin their their own land, and yet they're not doing it on on the public forest. Doesn't that sound extraordinarily uh, contradictory? Oh, I think they are doing it on certain portions of their own forest. Uh, the public forest? Oh, yeah. Uh, there's an area out South 14 uh, in the Manzano. I think you're right. There are uh, areas. It's limited, are small areas. and it's very effective. Uh, where, you know, Davy Canyon is another area where they're definitely working. But, there's, the, you know, my own experience, it's so labor-intensive. I've only got 32 acres to contend with, uh, and it's taken me two years with with hired help, and I'm nowhere near. Yeah, we do have a huge uh, labor-intensive job and ahead of us. This idea of putting young people to work, uh, you know, I'm no young person by any means, but you know, we can all do it. <laughs> Mr. Souter, it's just my hope that uh, there is not an endangered species uh, found on your property because you would not be able to even thin your own property then. I didn't ask anybody. I just got a chainsaw and went to work, so I might be in trouble. That's, that's a way to do it. Don't ask. Put us down as probable. Pardon? Put us in there is probable. Probably very. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. I just said we would like to help you. Put us down as probable help. Oh, probable help. You come help me, huh? I know how to run a chainsaw, too. We're liable to scare well, the, you. Well, the, the wildlife on my place is things like coyotes, rabbits, uh, roadrunners. Uh, and I really think they're thriving in the places where the grasses are growing, uh, where they weren't growing. You know, in just two yeah. years, I can see grass growing places that it didn't grow. So it's, it's, it's helping, I think. Gentlemen, I, I want to thank you for your uh, extraordinary testimony. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. And with this, this panel is excused. And now we recognize uh, panel number four, Dr. Wallace Covington, School of Forestry, Northern Arizona University, and uh, Dr. Tom Swetnam, Director, Laboratory of uh, Tree Ring Research, University of Arizona. Gentlemen, if you would take your place at the table. Dr. Swetnam, Dr. Covington. And as long as you're standing, let me ask you to raise your arm to the square. Do you promise and affirm under the penalty of perjury that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Dr. Covington, you're wait recognized for your testimony. Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. I hope uh, the microphone works. It does. <laughs> Thank you for uh, inviting me to testify before your committee. I think the work you're doing is very important work. And um, what I intend to do is just summarize from some of the documents that I within the five minutes. It's kind of hard for me sometimes to be brief. Um, we cannot bury our heads in the sand any longer. Western forest landscapes and human communities are being ravaged by preventable catastrophic fires. Does it matter where the, whether the fires were prescribed, accidental, or caused by lightning? Is that the issue? Not really. In fact, arguing about who starts a fire is unproductive. All of us caused the fires. We caused them by allowing our forest to become so overstocked with trees that they exceeded the carrying capacity of the land. The real question is, how do we overcome the barriers that prevent the restoration of western forest landscapes, especially in our increasingly, increasingly vulnerable ponderosa pine and associated forest and woodlands? Two myths contribute to the current situation. The first myth, that we do not have sufficient information to act. And the second, that we must achieve consensus on restoration treatments before we act. Despite the first myth, in fact, we know a great deal about how to accomplish restoration. 
Abundant scientific knowledge has resulted from research begun in the 1890s and research that continues today. We have solid information about pre-settlement forest conditions, changes in fire regimes, and ecological responses to thinning and prescribed burning. As for the second myth, total consensus among conservation professionals, environmental activists, and scientists is not possible. It never has been, it never will be. As we wait for consensus and perfect information, the forest becomes more vulnerable. This is unforgivable. We have the knowledge to protect these magnificent forests. We just need the courage and the will to implement solutions and to learn something while we're doing it. Our dry western forest ecosystems uh, before settlement were dominated by open park-like stands of ponderosa pine and other tree species with lush, diverse understories of grasses and wildflowers. Fire stopped abruptly after settlement. This was an active policy, and it wasn't by fire suppression directly. It was by intentional overgrazing as a way to stop fires from sweeping across the landscape. This was encouraged by natural resource professionals, not by ranchers necessarily. By the 1940s, enough trees and surface fuels had accumulated to allow fire to return but not the natural low-intensity surface fires that had shaped these ecosystems over millions of years. The fires that began in the 1940s burned through tree canopies. At first, the fires were small, a few hundred acres, and a small proportion of that area burned severely. By the 1950s and 1960s, the fires were larger and more severe. Beginning in the 1980s, we saw sudden leaps in fire size, severity, and destructiveness, not just to ecosystems, but also to human lives and property. Such leaps are often observed when complex systems fail. Ecologically-based forest restoration is the most effective way to reestablish the ecological integrity of the forest while protecting human communities. This approach is informed by science and establishes as its primary goal the restoration of fully functioning ecosystems that are linked to sustainable use by humans. Models exist for how to do this. The, this merging of managers, scientists, and communities to accomplish restoration is the basis for what Secretary of Interior Bruce Babbitt and U.S. Senator John Kyle have recently called the Flagstaff Plan. The restoration approaches developed by the Ecological Restoration Institute, which I direct, working with governmental and non-governmental organizations out at Mount Trumbull and in Flagstaff are a basis for defining socially acceptable series of restoration treatments to protect threatened communities and landscapes. I'm also greatly encouraged by the work that's going on in Santa Fe. I think there's a real opportunity to make some advances there if it results in action on the ground. That's the key to this. There's a lot of good intentions, but the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are barriers uh, to success. One is funding. This barrier, while not trivial, is relatively easy to solve when the will exists. The other barrier is inaction caused by obstructionism and perfectionism. Some people prefer inaction and attempt to stall progress by using legal challenges, bureaucratic entanglement, and unrealistic demands for perfect knowledge. Ironically, in degraded forest, this inaction becomes an action that leads to more degradation, increasingly severe crown fires that lead to loss of critical wildlife habitat, loss of homes, and most importantly, loss of human lives. The conse consequences of obstructionism are tragic. Time has run out. Knowing what we know now, we must act and we must act now. To do otherwise would be an abdication of our responsibility to future generations. And I think I made it within the time span. I think I'll stop right there and then wait for questions. Thank you, Dr. Covington. Dr. Swetnam, you're recognized. I thank you, uh, <clears throat> Madam Chairman, uh, and the subcommittee for inviting me to testify here today on this uh, really important topic. I've submitted my written testimony and uh, take a few minutes now to summarize, if I may. The uh, problem of increasingly large and severe crown fires in forests of the western and southeastern United States is very serious and requires urgent attention and action. 
The Cerro Grande wildfire and the many dozens of large fires of the past several months have made this abundantly clear. I have two main points uh, to make uh, in my testimony here today. The first is that long-term climate forecasts and assessments of regional condi conditions should be more explicitly included in fire management planning and implementation. Second is that forest restoration using both prescribed fire and mechanical thinning of trees is imperative. But reducing density of small diameter trees should be the primary target of this work. Before I explain these, these points in a little more detail, I thought I'd give you just a little bit of my personal and professional background. I was raised in New Mexico. Uh, I grew up in Hamas Springs, which is a, a little mountain village located about 50 miles north of Albuquerque here. It's just over the hill from Los Alamos. My father was a district ranger uh, for more than 30 years with the U.S. Forest Service. He retired about a dozen years ago. While growing up in the Hamas and while attending school here at the University of New Mexico, I remember seeing a number of enormous wildfires breaking out in the mountains around the city here and in, and in the southwest. This uh, being growing up around forests and, and fires really led to the scientific work that I do today. I'm a dendrochronologist, which is a tree ring scientist. And for the past 20 years, I've used tree rings to study the history of forest fires, insect outbreaks, climate changes, and cultural changes over time periods of years to millennia. The modern science of dendrochronology was invented at the <coughs> Laboratory of Tree Ring Research at the University of Arizona, where I'm director and professor of dendrochronology and watershed management. My students and I have carried out tree ring studies all over the world, uh, but I've always returned to the mountains of the Southwest because this is home and because there's such a rich history, a rich natural and cultural history. And these histories have lessons to teach us. They teach us that fire has been an essential component of our forest for eons. And then in the long run, uh, we cannot totally exclude fire from our forests. One of the primary lessons of these histories that I want to share with you today, because I don't think it has received as much attention in terms of the problems that we're having today, is that <coughs> climatic considerations are extremely important uh, to current and future forest fire management. This is particularly pertinent today, as the western U.S. is currently in the grips of a deep drought and one of the worst wildfire seasons of this century. One of the great um, breakthroughs in climatology has occurred in the last couple of decades. What we've come to know is that the Pacific Ocean, conditions in the Pacific Ocean, have a lot to do with climatic conditions in the western United States and also in the southeastern part of the United States especially. What I'm talking about here primarily is the climate phenomenon known as the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO for short. The ENSO pattern includes El Nino events, which typically increase rainfall in the southwest and the southeast, and La Nina events, which do the opposite. This past year, we have experienced an extreme La Nina event. Both the tree ring record and 20th century documentary records show that El Nino and La Nina have been intimately involved with both rainfall and fire activity in the southwest and southeast for centuries. Unfortunately, I think that we're behind the curve, that that the land management agencies have been a bit slow in developing and using this new breakthrough and some of the long-range climate forecasting tools that are now available. The current La Nina-related drought and very bad fire season that we're in now, for example, was anticipated by many of us uh, who have been studying this phenomenon for a number of years. Warnings about the high probability of the upcoming bad fire season were publicized and discussed as early as January and February of this year. One of the problems here is that although managers knew about this, the, the chances for a bad fire year this year, the current planning and decision-making tools do not adequately incorporate these long-term broad-scale perspectives uh, from fire climatology. The current tools for assessing prescribed burning risks, for example, are primarily based on fire meteorology and fire behavior, which inherently deal with short time scales over relatively small areas. Ultimately, we would have had a bad fire season this year even if there had been better use of the long-range forecast. Clearly, the fuel accumulations of the past century and during re recent wet and warm decades of the 20th century are major causes of the extreme fire be behavior we're now witnessing. Adding to our concern is a possibility that we may now have shifted into a pattern of drought that could persist for years to decades. The fuel accumulations of the past decades and century and the devastating fires that follow from them are the main reason why forest restoration is imperative. The primary problem is in the ingrowth of small diameter trees, 
that now form continuous canopies and ladder fuels underneath large diameter trees. In southwestern Ponderosa pine forests and in many other dry interior forests of the western U.S. that have a long history of logging, large diameter trees are now relatively uncommon. These large trees provide important structural components to the forest and are critical for wildlife habitat and aesthetic appeal. And in most cases, they are not the primary cause of the increased wildfire extent and severity. And for these reasons, I urge uh, maintaining large diameter trees in the southwest, especially in southwestern Ponderosa pine forest, wherever it is ecologically possible and safe to do so. I'll uh, conclude there. Thank you, Dr. Swetnam. The chair recognizes Mr. Udo for questions. Thank you uh, very much, Madam Chair. Dr. Covington, could you tell us a little bit about the, the Flagstaff plan? I'm wondering um, what all of that entails, what the costs are, and, and in particular, the, you talked about having the will to get this done. I mean, how did you get all the players at the table, and you, clearly you have Bruce Babbitt, who's a former governor of Arizona, and, and uh, uh, Senator Kyle working together, which is a, a, a good bipartisan combination there to, to move it forward. Well, um, first, the elements of the Flagstaff plan are that restoration is the basis for, for doing the fuel treatments. The idea behind that is to not just do a quick fix. There are lots of things you could do to stop fires from burning into towns um, that aren't restoration-based. But with a restoration-based approach, you can simultaneously accomplish that and make major conservation gains, not just for our generation, but for future generations. And that, ethically, I think we're compelled to do. So restoration's the basis of it. Um, the operational model is a community-based approach. So in that community-based approach, this uh, is a coalition of 15 organizations that range from the Nature Conservancy, the uh, Northern Arizona University, the Ecological Restoration Institute, the Grand Canyon Trust, um, a, a Chamber of Commerce, and so on, that got together and sat down and went through a self-education process over a period of about a year to try to get their Hand their minds around what the fundamental problem was, not just the symptom of fires burning into the landscape, but the fundamental problem. The triggering event was the fires of 96 around Flagstaff. We had fires of just unprecedented size and uh, severity. It, it was uh, devastating to the local community to see those sorts of fires. They were north of town. If they'd started south of town, it would have been, Flagstaff would have been the Los Alamos of, of 96. The, um, the approach is a science-based approach as opposed to a, a one informed by uh, intuition and kind of an arty, kind of it looks good or feels good kind of approach. So we, we have sought to, to use the best science available. And then uh, from an ethical standpoint, a strong recognition that we are ethically obliged to uh, take action to prevent further damage. Uh, what, what you hear people saying is a stitch in time saves nine, right? Obvious. That it's prudent and necessary for us to take the best action that we can when severe crises exist. And this is a national crisis that we're seeing here. It's one that's been foreseen for at least 75 years when the first warning signs went up about this. Aldo Leopold in 24 pointed this out to us, I, I think, as you well know. Um, and then the, there's another component of it is that it's a win-win. It's a win for humans across all walks of life and for ecosystems, for the land. So it's consistent with the land ethic. So that's the basic outline of the plan. As, for the, as far as the costs are concerned, so far the costs are quite ex, uh, high. Uh, because the treatment areas are very small, and um, it's, we are constrained uh, in that plan to harvesting trees that are under 16 inches. That's what the general agreement was, um, was to go with that largely for political reasons as opposed to ecological reasons. What are, what, when you say restoration, uh, what do you mean? Okay, by, by restoration, ecological restoration deals with trying to restore ecosystems to the kinds of conditions that they were in before degradation began. In the case of our western forest, that degradation began largely with um, fire exclusion um, and overcutting 
of uh, old growth trees, uh, overgrazing. As I said, intentional overgrazing encouraged by the, the federal government. So you determine what the natural conditions of the forest were. We call these reference conditions. And that becomes a reference point for managing the landscape, not a recipe, but a reference point. And then you deviate from that reference point for specific management objectives. Our, our treatment consists of conserving all old growth trees, leaving sufficient post-settlement trees, trees that came in after fire exclusion, to try to recreate um, natural conditions, using leaving extra trees for specific management objectives, treating the slash as quickly as you can, and then burning periodically to emulate the, the natural fire regime. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Udall. The chair recognizes Mrs. Wilson. Thank you, Dr. Covington. You mentioned that uh, consensus, you'll never be able to reach consensus. You have to act in this national crisis. In the Flagstaff example, were there still detractors, and did they move forward anyway? And can you describe oh, sure. how this happened uh, and using Flagstaff as, uh, how did they work it through? Yeah, we're still trying to move forward on an operational scale in Flagstaff. And of course, there are detractors. It's always, uh, it's, it's easy to find fault with any solution to a complex problem like this. And um, so we have had, uh, you know, appeals and threatened lawsuits, you know, that have slowed us down. We're not nearly as far along as we'd hoped to be. Um, unfortunately, the triggering event that we've got now of Los Alamos and the severe damage there. I wish that hadn't had to have happened. But now that that has happened, I think we may be able to move forward much more rapidly. One of the timing delays has been related to trying to accomplish the NEPA mm -hmm. um, compliance sort of a thing. And the agencies are severely understaffed to be able to do this right now. I mean, th it's easy to point fingers at the Forest Service and the Park Service and so on, but you know, these are my students you're pointing fingers at. <coughs> former students, and they're understaffed. These, these people are bright as hell, and they know what to do. They don't have enough people to do it and do it well. Um, we've been held up getting the NEPA documentation through in the, flag, the greater Flagstaff restoration plan. People are out fighting fires. They're over here at Los Alamos, and they're, over, you know, they're, they're all over the West. So we, we don't, the, the agencies don't have really the resources to do what they need to do. Are there changes to the the structure of NEPA or to the things that are required that wouldn't that would make the, the paperwork and the bureaucracy easier but without uh, it would streamline this without losing the objectives of NEPA uh, you know I, I don't know so much that it's NEPA it's more the regulations and how we we choose to try to comply with the objectives of NEPA um, I, I do feel like that like in the case of Mount Trumbull, for example, the Bureau of Land Management land at Mount Trumbull, Grand Canyon National Park where we're doing some work, and with the Coconino National Forest, the Kaibab National Forest around there, the, they, have the, the, they have the people that have the intelligence and the experience to do outstanding NEPA work. They just flat don't have the time to do it. So I, I think it's more of an input sort of a solution, is that we need to have people who can get on the NEPA process, be focused on it, and not be pulled all over the place, not just by fires, but lots of other stuff that pulls them away from being focused on a job. In lots of ways, I think of it as kind of a, the most severe sort of psychological torture you could put someone through. It's get a very capable person who knows they can do it, get them started on it, and then yank them away and make them do something else for a few minutes and let them come back to it and then yank them over here. And it's really stressful. It's why some of, my, some of our best students have left the agencies, because they can't put up with that level of stress. It's just so frustrating. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mrs. Wilson. And Mr. Skeen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam <clears throat> Chairman. I uh, don't have any questions for you, Dr. Covington, and so on. I do want to say that it's, it's a, you've certainly given us some good for, food for thought. I appreciate you being here today and participating. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Skeen. Uh, Mr. Covington, Dr. Covington, uh, I want to thank you both for your very outstanding testimony. Um, you did make a reference to overgrazing, and that got my attention. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I not only believe if you hug a logger, you'll never go back to trees, but sometimes it's nice to hug a rancher. <laughs> Ask me about that. Um, <laughs> You're doing well. Maybe don't. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Covington, uh, I, I do realize that certainly uh, around the turn of the century, there, the lands were sort of managed in commons, and there was a huge amount in the West that, that was overgrazed. Then Congress recognized that, that they needed to give people responsibility for making sure that our land was not overgrazed. And by doing that, they, of course, withdrew these lands in the West under various homestead acts, sometimes under a split estate, with the federal government maintaining the mineral estate while allowing the surface estate to be settled under various homesteads with allotments pertinent to the various fee lands, thereby giving a private property use right on the allotments. And I think even by the admission of, of Secretary Bruce Babbitt, our rangelands have been, uh, in large part, where we've been able to actively use them in a better condition. I know in Idaho that he admitted they were in a better condition than they have been for many years. So I just had to get that in. Um, so Dr. Covington, I, I would like for you to give us an example of what should a restored forest really, really look like. For instance, let's take Cloudcroft, for example. What would you envision for Cloudcroft if we had a restored and perfect forest there? I'm and not how would it be achieved? Yeah. Yeah, first, uh, let me just say a little something about the overgrazing. Um, I tried to allude to this in my comments. The overgrazing was not a decision made by ranchers necessarily. It was encouraged by f for early forest managers as a way to stop fires. It wasn't that ranchers said, hey, let's make, let's get as many livestock out there as possible. But this was seen as a good thing to do. Get rid of the forage so the fires would stop, and they did stop. With respect to uh, a restored forest, I'm not so sure the restored forest would be the perfect forest for today. Uh, uh, that is a, a forest that's strictly restored to pre-settlement conditions. We have a lot of other cultural desires from our forest today that are different from the forest of the 1500s or 1200s or whatever. Um, it's an important reference point, though. The other thing that I would say is that I've been in this uh, line of work for 30 years now, and constantly what, what you're approached with is we need a rule of thumb. How often should we burn? Is it like once every two years or once every 10 years or once every 15 years? And there's no good answer to that. Uh, the answer has to be a mixture of looking at the specific site and understanding its ecological conditions and then looking at the human uses of the land around that and the impacts of a particular treatment regime, whether it's thinning or uh, burning or livestock grazing or whatever that use might be, on the human components of that greater ecosystem. So I'm really not trying to dodge your question, but what I am trying to get at is that uh, one-size-fits-all kinds of solutions are not appropriate. There's no easy way to do this, and it doesn't lend itself, I think, to getting back to some of the earlier panels, to uh, centralized policies of, you know, we're going to have 23 trees per acre on class one ponderosa pine lands or something like that, or 50 or 60 or something like that, or the diameter limit stuff. So it's the same sort of thing. We're always looking for, let's codify this, you know, let's just get it into some strict objective here it is, I look it up and I say, oh, okay, now here's what we're going to do on this land. Certainly some of the misunderstandings about forest management have occurred because we've uh, encouraged a one-size-fits-all, for instance, in clear-cutting. Um, clear-cutting uh, can be devastating, uh, but in certain areas where we have disease infestation, sometimes it's necessary, such as with root rot. Mm -hmm. um, they use clear-cutting uh, successfully in the coastal zones where the regrowth is is quite rapid. Um, Dr. Swetnam, what is what is the uh, pioneer species after a fire in in this area of trees and what is the strongest native species in this area? 
Well, there's a tremendous variability in the, in the landscape here in the southwest going from desert, Sonoran Desert with saguaro cacti all the way up to subalpine forests. The, the, the forests that are most concerned to us, of course, are the ponderosa pine forests and the mixed conifer forests that had frequent surface fires in the past and now have, in the last century, have had fire excluded. So it's the sort of middle elevation zones. And in those zones, ponderosa pine is the dominant species in, in the, the middle elevations. And uh, for the most part, those forests did not burn catastrophically. In the pre-settlement era, our tree ring records show that frequent fires burn for centuries, once or twice per decade, typically. And so there wasn't really a replacement species, so to speak. They just cycled in place with the same species. As you move upslope, into the mixed conifer forests. Then you start getting the white fir and the Douglas fir and some other species. And in those cases, and the higher elevations, such as the tops of our mountains here, the Sandia Mountains and the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, there were catastrophic crown fires at those high elevations in the pre-settlement era. But they were of smaller extent. The patches that were created were of smaller sizes. And the pioneer species that came in then were aspen. And you can still see those aspens today from some stand replacing fires that occurred in the late 19th century. They're, they're decaying now. And in fact, aspen is a little bit of a problem now in terms of the numbers and the extent of aspen is probably decreasing because there haven't been so many large fires. So it's really important to kind of keep this in mind, this distinction between catastrophic crown fires in ponderosa pine forest, which is really anomalous. It's, it's really something that probably hasn't occurred for hundreds, if not thousands of years on those sites versus the high elevation forests where catastrophic crown fires were more of a natural phenomenon. But now we're getting both catastrophic fires all across the elevational gradient and in the high elevations as well. The patches that are being created, the holes created by these big blowouts are much bigger uh, than they probably were in the past. <clears throat> so then could one conclude that because of the new intensive management, sometimes uh, species that were not indigenous to a certain area were introduced that created a forest to become, created a forest that could become easily stressed. You testified the ponderosa pine was a native species that it could tolerate fire. Um, so would, would you advocate uh, strong forest management in, in, in uh, restoring forests to make sure that the native st species were replanted and restored? Sure, I, yeah, I, I think that managers need to use all the tools that are available to, um, to restore our forests, particularly our, our forests that had these high frequency surface fire regimes. And so I, I feel strongly that this is going to be a combination, it, it is going to need to be a combination of mechanical thinning with machines, with chainsaws, to go in and remove primarily small diameter trees, but also fire. We must include fire in the mix wherever it's possible and feasible. And I understand it's not going to be in many places because of the threats to the communities and to the smoke conditions. But wherever it is possible, fire should be part of the mix because it's really essential to so many of the native and natural species to, to, to have fire within that system as well for nutrient cycling and so on. So yeah, I'm very, I'm very supportive of the idea that we must, that we have a big, big job ahead of us in terms of, of forest restoration and uh, restoring some resiliency and sustainability to our forests. Gentlemen, your, your testimony was uh, very, very interesting. Um, <clears throat> and I have followed your, your career and your publications. I, uh, I was particularly interested, Doc, Dr. Covington, in your addressing the, the psychological factor that, that goes into decision making. I think those of us up here who heard the testimony from the GAO <coughs> where the fire boss uh, didn't recognize that a prescribed fire by definition was a hazardous wildfire very shortly, and his reticence to demand help when he was there on the fire um, and not be satisfied with the little help that was given. But, uh, you know, we, we, we'd like to see people who are screaming into the telephone that the help must come. Um, the, the governor who responded so well should have been, uh, should have been notified. And uh, we're seeing that that kind of notice is, is not occurring. It must. But I want to ask both of you, uh, doctors, uh, what is your recommendation to, to Congress? Uh, what do we need to do to change uh, the situation and how can we best help? Uh, there does have to be a psychological change within the agencies. There must be. 
but um, we can't deal with that by law and even by rules or regulations that can happen in, in the agency. What do you reckon, recommend that we can do be, beyond uh, what, what we have done? <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm not sh let's see. Well, I, th I think there are people within the agencies that I, I know there are that fully understand this problem and want to do something about it. Um, they're frustrated too. Uh, resources are needed. I don't think there's a lot of legislation that's needed or anything like that is, is kind of my general assessment. But when you, whether you look at the Forest Service or the Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, Fish and Wildlife Service, the federal agencies, the state agencies, this, they've gotten the message. And there, are, there is the expertise, I think, at some level within each of the agencies to be able to do this. There, there are some institutional barriers, as you were alluding to, in, for example, in parks and wilderness areas. Um, from a conservation biology standpoint, these are critical to the future of sustainability of threatened and endangered species. And those areas are very difficult to do restoration treatments in. Um, I think certainly within the, the people that are managing parks and wilderness areas, they, they recognize, most of them recognize that it's too late for prescribed fire alone to do the restoration treatments that need to be done. Uh, in dense forest conditions. But, you know, again, they're in a kind of a bind here because we've had this assumption that park and wilderness areas were natural and didn't need any help at all. And in the case of ponderosa pine, lower mixed conifer, upper elevation pinyon juniper ecosystems, clearly they're way out of whack. And as one of the earlier uh, panelists described, some of them are in the very worst condition that we've got anywhere in the nation. And yet those areas which are so critical for conserving biological diversity, they're the core areas of greater ecosystems, have, are, the, are the most difficult areas to do any restoration around. I think at the very least what we ought to be doing is looking at them as we do our urban areas. We ought to be trying to put restoration fuel breaks around them. In a way, they're the urban areas for rare and, and declining species. If you if you catch my analogy there, so at the very least we ought to be trying to be, do some restoration fuel breaks around our wilderness area and parks until we overcome the institutional barriers and and you know to really be able to take action. Thank you, Dr. Covington. Dr. Swetnam. Thank you. There's there's a couple of things. Um, I think that uh, one of the big challenge really, of course, is, is the restoration and how to do it and the leadership and the scientific research that needs to be done in combination with it. I think what we need are several more uh, or many more uh, institutes such as the one that uh, Dr. Covington has taken leadership of and built up at NAU around the western U.S. Uh, that is, we need places where there's centers of excellence uh, and, and there's, there's support, scientific support, people working with managers to actually undertake restoration programs. We need different ones around the different parts of the country so that there's a variety of approaches and a variety of different, different uh, uh, minds working on this project at the same time. The second thing is I think that the, the fire management organizations need more support. They need, they need more funding for, for firefighters and for training of firefighters. I think there's a real serious problem right now with, with uh, uh, retirements of experienced people out of the firefighting service. Um, there's a lack, as we've seen this year, when we've had a big fire year like this year, we're going to the military to, to find people to do some of this firefighting. Uh, I would argue that we need to have these people trained in advance. And if we pay attention to climate, if we pay attention to the changes in interannual climate variability, we could anticipate these needs months in advance. So we should be training in a year like this. We've just come through a very severe dry winter over a good part of the western U.S. and southeastern U.S. We should be training troops in the spring, in February and March. So there, there needs to be more support for the fire management or organizations in terms of bringing more people in and also keeping keeping uh, good firefighters in the agency. Now, now we have a seasonal firefighting uh, uh, is, is a big part of the whole firefighting force are seasonals and most of these people work for six or eight years and then they quit because they can't support a family on that. We need a, prof a larger professional class of firefighters that are kept on year round and during the winter months are working on fuel treatments between the snow banks, literally. 
uh, in treating fuel. So I would, I would, I think that's something that's really needed is an increase in the, in the funding and support for for fire managers, and fuel managers. Very good. Um, usually, the members up here don't testify, but something I would like for for you and the members to put into your matrix of thinking about what we do with this problem is. <clears throat> San Diego just last week experienced um, power shortages and they had to systematically shut down uh, San Diego. And suddenly people realized we don't have enough resources to meet our energy demands. Back in the early 70s, Democrat uh, Congressman um, Jim Weaver from Oregon, he served in the 4th Congressional District in Oregon, envisioned what finally President Carter instituted in the Public Utility Regulatory Policy Act of 78, which was an amendment to the Energy Act, he, coupled with what Mr. Weaver did, envisioned that individuals could go out and, and get this uh, down fuel load and clean the forest up and provide a profit motive, and that is build cogeneration plants that would produce energy that, uh, that given that they could supply reliable energy could feed into our grids and uh, provided the, actually PURPA provided the breakdown of the monopoly um, of just the power companies providing energy, but for people across the nation to also be providing energy, what a great vision that was and how much we need that now and it's not happening. It should be reinstituted because honestly, as much as some people don't like it, the profit motive has, has served to make this country the great country that it is and it could serve if we reinstituted PURPA again um, it, it could serve to help us out of a very devastating situation. I know that there are cogeneration facilities dotted throughout the West, but we really need them in more abundance now. Um, extraordinary testimony on climatic conditions. I've been personally very interested in that. And uh, very good testimony on, uh, on everything that you've offered, Dr. Covington, including the psychological impacts of decision making. Thank you gentlemen very much for your testimony. And the chair, and you are excused now, Thank and you. the chair now recognizes um, <clears throat> Ms. Uh, Eleanor Towns, uh, Regional Forester, Southwest Region, uh, USDA Forest Service, and uh, Ms. Karen Wade, Regional Director, National Park Service. <laughs> How are you? Ladies, uh, as you know, you've been provided a copy of the uh, of the committee rules and you have be appeared before the committee before. So I wonder if you could stand and raise your hand to the square. Do you promise and affirm under the penalty of perjury that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Ms. Towns, you're recognized for your testimony. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to participate. I'm accompanied by Mr. Leonard Atencio, who is Forest Supervisor on the Santa Fe National Forest, and Mr. Jose Martinez, who is Forest Supervisor on the Lincoln. I'm going to talk to you today about three things, all related to the Southwest. Forest conditions, what we are trying to do about them and the help that we need. Today, it's uh, and probably an understatement to say that uh, Western wildland fires are, are definitely on the nation's radar screen. The problem is too many trees. Too many trees. The problem is too many trees. Too many trees compete for limited rain and nutrition, making them susceptible to insect, disease, and wildfire. In a healthy forest, fire burns low to the ground and cleans up debris in the woods. F 
fire in a thick forest goes from smaller trees to taller trees to the crowns of the tallest trees. And such hot, intensive fires are likely to kill all of the trees, sterilize the soil, and when the rains finally come, result in floods and landslides. Where there are houses, there is the potential for loss of life and property. As Dr. Sweatman and Dr. Covington have so eloquently pointed out, these conditions have been developing for over a century. So I ask your forbearance if I exceed the five minutes you have allotted me. There are lots of reasons why the forests are in such bad shape. Past fire suppression policies are probably the major culprit. Timber practices have been complicated by people moving into the wildlands. The Southwest, as you know, is the fastest growing part of the country. People flock here for the moderate weather and open spaces. We move to counties with large holdings of public land. We want to live in, work in, and recreate in the trees, but we want to do that without seeing our neighbors. And we use the same limited water that the critters need. The fact is the people did come, and it's easy to imagine that the public dialogue 50, 75 years ago was very much like the one we're having today. In tender, dry conditions just like today, the public demanded that we suppress fires and protect lives, structures, and forest resources. Today's acad academicians indicate that a century of suppression has been by far the major culprit. But I also want to talk about past timbering practices. In response to our need to manage the woods and, frankly, the economic needs of our neighbors, we laid out timber sales, sometimes for industry convenience and support. In the Southwest, we permitted timber practices such as pick and pluck that left too many small trees and generated watershed problems. In other parts of the country, it was clear cutting that led to concerns about watershed deg degradation, wildlife, habitat loss, and growth of single species and even aged trees. As a result of that, some claimed that all tree cutting was bad, and they demanded that all trees be left in place. Well, that line sold until Los Alamos. Local governments are responsible for zoning, building requirements, evacuation, and matters pertaining to private lands. And I want to say that it's been a privilege to work with the State Forester and Bernalillo County in the East Mountains, Rio Doso and Sunspot, on evacuation plans and defensible space. Others are just beginning this task. In short, these conditions have been developing for a century, and we will not correct them by ourselves or quickly. But here's what we're trying to do. In 1999, we treated over 122,000 acres. That's up from 38,000 acres in 1994. In June, we in this region, this region, put together a strategic plan of action for the protection of life and property for the long haul. The Forest Service and the state foresters identified priority areas and the staffs are talking to ensure that the lists overlap and that we maximize our efforts across the federal private fence. I took our list and I instructed the four supervisors to divide it into three groups. I needed to know what was NEPA ready now. And so phase one includes 17,000 acres of national forest, wildland, urban interface acres in New Mexico where the environmental analysis is complete and the projects are ready to implement as soon as the fires abate. The estimated cost of that effort will be three and a half million. By December 31st, we expect to have the environmental work completed on an additional 57,000 acres in New Mexico and at a cost, the cost jumps here, of 48.5 million to do the work on the ground. Working in and around the towns is costly. Now, we have a much longer list for out years, but our message is it will be costly and it will take time to complete this work. 
In the near term, we are hiring 200 new persons to help with this effort. And a regional team is working to convert many of those hotshot crews that you just heard Dr. Swetman talk about, most of whom, as he said, work seasonally, and we're trying to convert them to permanent employment status for the same reasons that he mentioned, which would allow year-round availability to fight fires in the summer and to do or oversee thinning and NEPA work the rest of the year. Our prescribed fire manual has already been redrafted to incorporate recommendations from this year's GAO fire review and the fire investigation report on the Los Alamos fire. Dr. Covington has already described the Grand Canyon forest work around Flagstaff. And in Catron County, New Mexico, we worked with the Catron County Citizens Council to help position them to both treat the woods and provide economic stability to the county. We support their business plan and have committed to a supply of restoration wood coming off the Gila National Forest. The first such project, Sheep Basin, is due to be NEPA cleared by the end of the year. Sheep Basin is part of the Greater Negrito Ecosystem Project and it ultimately will treat over 127,000 acres. The State Forester has alluded to the Four Corners Project, which uses Forest Service funds to develop marketable products from the small timber that we're attempting to clear. We work with land-grant communities who thin the forest and use the wood that they take. We work with the State Forester and inmate crews to thin and prescribe burn in the east mountains of the Cibola National Forest. And here in the southwest, the federal family worked together to streamline implementation of the Endangered Species Act. I think, Madam Chairman, we first talked about this when I went back to talk about grazing. And we talked about nearly 700 permits having been NEPA-ized in a relative, uh, having gone through endangered species consultation, excuse me, in a relatively short period of time. That was a result of that uh, conscious effort on the part of the agencies to work together to streamline our processes. But the agencies also got together and hired consultants to help with our work in Cloudcroft, Silver City, and Rio Arriba County. And there we're working with community leaders to try to um, uh, hone both their skills and our skills in working collaboratively together. As others have pointed out, much of the time that it takes to do some of the projects and some of the thinning work has possibly to do with NEPA. A lot of it has also to do with trust and the selling of the need for this prior to Los Angeles and Los Alamos with uh, members of the communities. Our collective federal efforts are known as the Southwest Strategy. And the lieutenant governor of this state and his cabinet members sit with federal regional executives. But we need help. And there's a longer list, I guess, that's been included in part of the, the official testimony. There is much more to do than we are now doing and probably than we are now capable of doing. I want to say to the members that we appreciate the open-ended funding for fire suppression, but that is a costly answer costly in dollars and the potential loss of lives, homes, resources, and habitat. We still need that suppression safety net, but there is another answer that can restore the woods and provide work in our communities. And those are what we call fire risk reduction dollars. Those dollars would go for NEPA clearance, both with our staff and Dr. Swetman, I believe it was, pointed out the, uh, some of the decisions that we have to make about using a limited number of people to do a lot of things. And so we're talking about contract work for some of the NEPA. Um, and that we would do contract work to actually get some of the work, the, the trees pulled out of the, out of the woods. And we would ask that uh, contractors include local hires, welfare to work citizens, um, we need to do, uh, we would use risk reduction for prescribed fire and removal of debris that essentially has no economic value. Risk reduction dollars, unlike fire suppression dollars, would be spent with the added benefit of jobs for communities. 
And I want to just take a moment to talk a little bit about New Mexico and the communities across our region who are working with us on these collaborative efforts, not unlike Flagstaff. Those projects are expensive, multi-year efforts. And in our current yearly appropriation system, their worry is that they will be funded for the out years. And so we need to keep faith with those communities and the people who are working with us to find middle ground. Five of those in, are in critical communities, the East Mountains, where it does take the money to continue the work that uh, Congressman Wilson has observed, Rio Doso, where we've gotten a good start, the Rio Panasco project, which has gotten an influx of money here recently, and that would do some of the needed restoration work around Cloud Cloudcroft, the Santa Fe watershed, as soon as that one is NEPA cleared, and as I've mentioned, uh, the, ne the Negrit Negrito ecosystem project in Catron County. And of course, we have continuing needs in rural northern New Mexico where we spend a lot of work and a lot of effort with our land grant communities on these thinning efforts. State and private funding, these are some of the Forest Service pots, is important to the work of volunteer fire departments. Continued research dollars, and we in NFS, National Forest Systems, don't often remember our research brothers, but continued research dollars are being used to develop marketable products for the small stuff. We brought people out from Madison to go out into the woods around the Four Corners area and work with the communities there. And also the research dollars to help us learn more about the holistic approaches to habitat management. Some of the things that uh, Dr. Savory has mentioned, and as well, I have spent some time with uh, Tommy Klein Martin of Higher Ground, who does something very similar, and I'm almost to conclusion. <laughs> some will say, if only the Endangered Species Act. The fact is, it was the Congress that in its wisdom passed that act some 27 years ago. We live in a nation of laws. We who work in this nation of laws for the government are not free to ignore some because executing those laws would be inconvenient or controversial. The Mexican spotted owl has taught all of us the hard way. We can't pick and choose. When we do, we risk injunctions that shut down industries. In the long run, we serve no one when we don't regulate as required by law. We are in cahoots with no one. Lord knows there are days when the best it gets is everybody is only a little bit mad at us. <laughs> the fact is we were not consistently enforcing any of the environmental acts and third parties brought us and the industry to legal task for it. To this day, a minority of users, by no means all, continue to noisily resist the compliance that the courts have ordered. I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak, and um, <coughs> I'm supposed to say that I'm going to be happy to answer the, your questions. <laughs> Chair recognizes Mrs. Ms. Wade for her testimony. Thank you very much. I'm prepared to summarize my comments and ask that my uh, full text of my comments be entered into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair and um, all of you, thank you so much for asking me to be here. I'm sure you're primarily interested in uh, my reactions to, uh, to date to what has uh, been uh, a very trying time and relates to the Cerro Grande fire. But I also want to comment some on um, what the National Park Service is involved with as it relates to this bigger issue of the uh, urban wildland interface. Um, as I, I have with me also here today, Rick Gale, who is the chief of uh, fire and aviation for the Park Service. And um, as we get into some of the more detailed policy issues, uh, he may be very helpful to us in answering some questions. As I did on May 10th, I want to again extend my regrets and my sincere sympathies to every one of the people involved um, from uh, Los Alamos and from the Santa Clara and Santa Del Fonso Pueblos. Uh, we continue to grieve uh, for what has occurred and we know 
that the losses that were suffered uh, cannot ever be uh, compensated for. We uh, are working, however, very closely with FEMA to assure that that process runs smoothly. We have been collecting claims ever since uh, the fires, uh, 1,500 of them to date, and we'll turn over all of that information to FEMA very shortly. We understand that FEMA has in place a toll-free number at this moment. Uh, that number is 1-888-748. 1853 and they're prepared to begin to deal directly with all of those involved uh, uh, we will shortly disconnect our toll-free number which has been in place since the fires occurred we will continue to do everything that we possibly can to assist with the rehabilitation efforts uh, we have staff engaged in that and we have made uh, offers uh, to be engaged for the future in any efforts that would be helpful to the communities uh, that were affected. Congressman Wilson, the National Park Service is committed to learn from what went wrong, and we are committed to assure that it does not happen again. And to all of you, I want to say that we are committed to work with our partners uh, at the local and the federal levels to do everything we can to deal with this urban wildland interface issue. Uh, we believe that we can be a part of the solution as a member of the team and we want to be. Steps have been taken and are underway to review all of the investigative reports and, uh, and to attempt to include all of those into uh, what will eventually be changes in the way we conduct our prescribed fire program. Uh, while this is occurring, the moratorium is still underway uh, west of the 100th Meridian for the National Park Service. And uh, as, it, as it turns out, we are engaged so actively in uh, doing wildland fire at the moment that we wouldn't have the resources to do prescribed fire anyway. The secretaries have reconvened the wildland fire policy team. Uh, the NPS is busy working on a three-phase process which would be utilized for reinstating NPS prescribed fire program. And clearly that will not begin until well after this season is over. The National Academy of Public um, Administration is reviewing NPS implementation of our prescribed fire program and uh, I believe will give us uh, a good deal of, of information that will be useful to us as we revise the way we go about doing our business. Two other projects are also underway. A Department of Interior interagency team is working to identify strategies to reduce the risks and consequences of catastrophic fire, wildfires on Department of Interior lands and neighboring urban interface areas. Also, the Park Service is working to complete an assessment of the management goals we would use to manage the wildland urban interface as it relates to units of a national park system. Perhaps it goes without saying that hazardous fuels continue to present a wildland threat to many wildland er, wildfire threat to many wildland urban interface areas adjacent to national parks. We are committed to using all tools at our disposal, including mechanical removal to reduce hazardous fuels and protect our visitors, our neighbors, our facilities, and America's irreplaceable treasures. In the future, prescribed fire must remain a component of our program because fire is more than just a tool for reducing uh, fuels. Fire is a part of ecological processes that we must restore if we are to achieve our mission for managing natural areas. Let me emphasize that the National Park Service understands that there are some areas in which mechanical fuel treatments either alone or followed by prescribed fire are the best tools for reducing overcrowded forest conditions and hazardous fuels and fuel accumulations. And this is especially true in urban interface parks, which we have quite a few of. Once we and our fire management partners, and that's our partners at all levels, 
of government, local and um, federal, have in place an improved decision-making and interagency coordination process for prescribed fire. And we've completed our risk assessments, comprehensive risk assessments. We will be able to move forward to systematically set national priorities for protecting the wildland urban interface. We can work safely at restoring a more natural ecosystem process and establish ecological integrity across a large portion of our federal lands. We believe that a comprehensive, systematic approach will provide the most cost-effective use of funds and ensure that NPS efforts are focused on the highest priority efforts where we can do the most good. It took more than 100 years to create the fuel problem in the West, largely due to aggressive fire suppression. The problem won't be solved in a few years. The federal agencies will have to focus their efforts for many years, perhaps decades, on restoring a more natural role for fire where feasible and on creating and sustaining buffer zones around wildland urban areas with mechanical treatments where prescribed fire is infeasible. During this time, it is imperative that all the federal land management agencies and the states maintain a strong suppression capability and enhance our capacity wherever possible and continue to enhance our relationships. Uh, and at this time, I must say that uh, I, our relationship with the National Forest Service has never been better. We've worked uh, successfully through some very trying times, and I'm very grateful to Ellie Towns. And, all her staff and Lyle Laverty for everything they've done this year. We must face the likelihood that there will be more catastrophic wildfires in the years ahead before we can significantly mitigate the fuels problem. An efficient level of firefighting resources, including adequate levels of firefighting personnel, comprehensive prescribed burning, and mechanical fuels reduction programs will be essential components of managing fire on public land in the years to come. And uh, just a, a thought uh, from, all, for, from my heart uh, to uh, all of those firefighters who are out there fighting fire today, who were joined uh, this week with, fi with firefighters from Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and Mexico. Uh, we have become an international effort. And at this time, I'd be pleased to answer any questions. I want to thank you for your testimony. Before I uh, ask Mr. Udall for, uh, for recognize him for his questions, I just want to say that in 1972, when the Endangered Species Act was passed, it was never envisioned by the Congress, even though the Congress did pass that act. It was never envisioned that, um, in fact, the debate was that we needed to save the great blue whale and the bald eagle. It was never envisioned by this Congress that we should be protecting mice and snails like we are in northern Idaho, and that because of a listing of a spotted owl that, that uh, we, we can't do the necessary work that would pre ultimately prevent forest fires that uh, were referenced by uh, Ms. Wilson. Um, Congress never envisioned the fact that um, the other agencies, those other agencies being the Fish and Wildlife Service, would serve as anything other than consultants to the Forest Service in the management of their lands. Congress never envisioned that the Forest Service or the Park Service should give up their responsibilities mandated by Congress to a, um, a climate of inability to make decisions. So to blame Congress, and then to also say Congress isn't appropriating enough money, they're cutting our budget. Uh, this member is more than concerned about that. Over the last few years, we have continued to appropriate money in greater degrees than we ever have before, but unfortunately, it's not getting to the field. And uh, that's something that Mr. Chairman we need to deal with uh, less gingerly than we have in the past. No and perhaps can. they're not going to get the message until we start cutting their budget, for goodness <laughs> sakes, and beginning to contract out to, uh, to counties or states for the management. If, if they can't begin to make decisions, Mr. Chairman, um, I look forward to, uh, to some new policy making when I'm out of the Congress and you're still chairman. Um, You're easy to please, but don't let you. it all happen at once. <laughs> it may not. But um, 
Congress never envisioned that a whole system of power making and, uh, and irrigation, such as in the Columbia River, would be subject to the crazy thinking that we ought to tear out all the dams on the Columbia River. In, in view of the fact that this year we have had record salmon returns of adult salmon, and they're still talking about tearing out the dams. Congress never envisioned that agencies would be held hostage to a few elite environmental organizations or be held hostage to the most effective and the most powerful lobbying organization in Washington, D.C., and that is the Sierra Club. Congress never envisioned that there would not be a deep understanding by 80 percent of the people who live in this country east of the Mississippi who feel free on both sides of the aisle to give a cheap environmental vote to the environmental organizations. It's time that has to change because what's happening out here is going to happen in the east. It's already happening in Florida. This country needs to come together without regards to uh, party politics or regions and again, uh, employ the very best management decisions, not just in budgets, not just in the military, but in our land management decisions. With that, Mr. Udall, you're recognized for questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Madam Chair. The, um, I think both of you were here and heard me talk about the Santa Fe watershed, and I, I was wondering specifically where we are on the timeline. Uh, Ms. Towns, you mentioned the, the uh, after we had NEPA clearance, we were going, going to be able to go forward. I mean, where, what, what kind of timeline are we looking at in terms of uh, uh, getting going with the actual restoration? It's my understanding the NEPA is... And I know you have your very capable yeah. uh, supervisor here from the Santa Fe National Forest, Mr. Atencio. If I may, uh, uh, we hope to have that completed, Congressman Udall, by uh, spring of 2001, so that we would like to begin implementation of projects uh, next summer. Is Santa Fe being fa held up by the resources issue or any of the other areas in New Mexico being held up? Go ahead. Congress Congressman, as far as the... Oh, I'm sorry, we need to swear you under the oath. Or anyone else who may be, uh, Ms. Townsend, Ms. Wade, anyone else you may refer to uh, yes. for answers? Yes, Mr. Gale. Do you promise and affirm under the penalty of perjury that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I help you guide? I do. Thank you. Please proceed. In regards to the question on And the I'm Santa sorry Fe. to interrupt you again. <laughs> Would you please identify yourself for the recorder and your position and your address? Yes, sir. I'm Leonard Atencio. I'm the forest supervisor on the Santa Fe National Forest. Uh, Congressman Udall, on the question on the resources for the Santa Fe watershed, uh, we have uh, enough resources at this time to proceed with the completion of the NEPA planning. Uh, so we're really in good shape for this year, and, and we believe that with the resources we have and the timetable that we can get that accomplished by next spring. Good. That's, that's very encouraging to, uh, to hear that. Let, let me also say to uh, Ms. Wade, I know that you were out here very early on. Uh, Director Stanton was here. Um, my constituents up there in Los Alamos and the, and the, uh, the other fires, the Vivash fire and the, the Man Manuelitas fire, all very much appreciate that you were out here and on the scene and that your, your <laughs> apologies. And so I think that's, uh, um, that's very important that you did that. Do you, do you sitting here today, listening to the um, all of these panels, do you have any thoughts on where we ought to head and, and uh, what Congress ought to do to, to tackle this problem? As we've been uh, looking at our policies, it, it seems pretty clear to me that we have uh, enough legislation to do what we need to do. Uh, it's a matter, I think, of, of trying to figure out a more comprehensive strategy uh, that involves all levels of government and is um, 
is a partnership, true partnership, between those levels of government. And uh, I believe that the Park Service at least has um, an, uh, the law legislation that it needs. And, and our policies seem to allow us to do what needs to be done as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I know we're on the yellow light here, but Ms. Towns, could you tell, tell us briefly, or maybe you're going to refer to Leonard, the, what you're doing with the northern New Mexico in terms of working with them on thinning projects? Yeah, we have uh, worked with on the Carson and on the Santa Fe and also on the Cibla with land-grant communities who sign up um, to maintain and thin uh, X acres and uh, take the wood out and it becomes a community uh, project and uh, there's a good deal of pride in it and uh, the material then is used either for firewood or in some of the small businesses that are needed in that in those rural economies. And, and this really provides an opportunity for rural employment. You're using local people, you're, you're in my understanding. Yes. Um, and I've heard many of them talk about <laughs> Um, the grass is coming back and even yes. seeing uh, increased numbers of what uh, were called endangered species. I fear to use the word endangered species around the chair here. Sometimes it gets <laughs> her really riled up. But, she said, but, but it sounds like some very encouraging uh, uh, things are, are happening. And so yeah. um, thank you for that work up there because I, those are communities in northern New Mexico that that have been here for hundreds of years. As, as you know, I've, I've talked to you about this before. They, they've got a tie to the land. They care about the land. They really want to see it be productive. And I, and I think that uh, uh, those thinning contracts are very important. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Udall. Um, <clears throat> yes, it does uh, get me riled up. I forgot to mention uh, the gray wolves that are being introduced in here and the grizzly bears in my, in my state. We could go on and on, couldn't we? Ms. Wilson, I understand you have to leave uh, right away. And I want to thank you for inviting us um, into your district and for your fine work on this issue and you're recognized for questions. It's an honor to have you all here. I wanted to ask a, a couple of questions. Uh, uh, and the first is for you, Ellie, or whomever would be the appropriate to, to answer it. When you have a situation like Los Alamos where the forest is burned and now they're trying to get folks in there to clear the down timber and to, to kind of do a salvage operation, why does it take so long to, I mean, golly, National, I National Environmental Policy Act stuff for that. I mean, I, why does it take so long and how can we make it faster? Yeah, I, it, you know, that is really hard for regular folk and, and some of us in here to understand. But first of all, let me say that um, salvage, of course, is not the only treatment for restoring the land. But where there is timber that's uh, already burned, it's on the ground, and there is a marketable use for it, if we can get it out soon enough, it does become somewhat frustrating. But the point is still that uh, we are advised that NEPA is required, and in order to get through NEPA, there is a time period that we try as we may are not able to collapse much more than four to six months. And that depends upon whether or not it's uh, appealed, which adds some period of time, or litigated. Madam Chair, I'm not, a, you know, I'm not on the Resources Committee, as you well know, but it seems to me that after, that, that there probably should be some modification of that law so that there are special circumstances after wildfires so that folks can get in and take out the damaged timber so we don't keep, keep doing this again and again and again. It, I have a question about wilderness areas. Again, this is just something I just don't know, don't understand. When you, when you have downed wood in a wilderness area, as we have on the, on the Sandias, on the back side of the Sandias, east side, um, is it possible to have permits for folks to go in there and take out down wood as firewood? Or is it just not allowed? It's my understanding that they can take the downed wood out. The problem was described by Mr. Souter in that the lands that are frequently wilderness are um, high up in the, um, high in altitude. The terrain is difficult. Uh, there, by definition, it's wilderness, so there are no roads. And so even if it's taken out, 
um, it, it's a monumental task and that probably is, is discouraging to many who otherwise would. Have you, have and, you ever? And of course it would all have to be hand work, so. Do you have any or have you in your, in your period of time here uh, allowed any permits to take down wood out of the wilderness? I don't know. One final question for you has to do with the projects that you have uh, mm -hmm. um, identified and potentially other underway, and it's really more a comment than a question, and it has mostly from my background <coughs> working with, with kids who have, uh, yes. have too much time and more than enough energy. Mm -hmm. and, and there are a lot of mostly boys in this four county area who are who are, have been told they have to do community service and would learn a whole lot from serving the community and doing important work alongside positive adult role models. Yes. And, and I'd highly encourage you to get with the chiefs of probation and parole and the folks at the Youth Diagnostic and Development Center and, the, and Camp Sierra Blanca because there's a, uh, there are some boys that need meaningful things to do and, and the community could benefit from it, and, and so would they. Sure. And we have, I have raised that question as well. Um, there is interest on the part of our managers. The, we would have to look into things like their age and what they're able to do and, the, and the, the kinds of restrictions, but yes, there ought to be some way to make a match there. I suspect there's, there's a hassle factor and, uh, but sometimes those hassle factors are worth working through mm -hmm. for the end result, both for sure. the community and, uh, and for the boys. Ms. Wade, I have a, a question for you. You said that the Park Service has asked the National Academy of Public Administration to make some recommendations about the management of the fire program, prescribed burn program. Who are those guys? Well, it's a, um, it's an organization which is, uh, Naturally, nationally recognized for its, uh, its uh, uh, knowledge of public administration. And uh, I don't have its credentials here in front of me, but I'd be glad to provide those. Are they, is it located at a university or within a federal agency? I've never, I don't know who those are. That? Yes, sir. The National Academy of Public Administration is just that. It's an organization in Washington, D.C. It's made up of academicians of public administrations made up of a lot of, you'll see a lot of mayors on there, governors, you'll see a lot of ex-cabinet members on there. It's uh, really an organization of public policy and public administrators at the highest organizations level. Please identify yourself I'm and sorry. your position and your address. Rick Gale, Chief of Fire and Aviation, Boise, Idaho. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. And before Ms. Wilson has to leave, I want to recognize uh, three of her staff members that have been extraordinarily helpful in getting this uh, committee uh, hearing together. I'd like them, if you don't mind, I'd like for them to, to stand and be recognized. Uh, Jane Altwees. Jane, are you here? All right. Thank you, Jane. And Holly Lawrence. Thank you, Holly. And uh, Julie Dreich. Thank you, Julie. Thank you all very much, and, and uh, thank you for your help. Appreciate it. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Skeen for his questions. Well, I want to thank my cohort here for thanks for putting in a pitch for Sierra Black. Yes, sir. You got any kids you want to send down there? We'll go take care of them. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Thomas, <clears throat> have you been getting the support for your budget request that you submit to, to Washington? Yes. You're happy with it? Well, there are some uh, areas when... <laughs> That's what I'd like to hear about. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first time you've had any proposal to that. Yes, no. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> we can always use more. Well, is the forest health and minimizing fire danger your top uh, priority? And Absolutely. And can the present uh, NEPA process and forest planning process be streamlined without uh, harming environmental interests, in your view? I wouldn't pretend, sir, to make a sweeping uh, prediction in that regard. The laws are in place for, for good reason, and uh, a good deal of good does come from them, and I think that... They're not a hindrance to you. They are 
not a hindrance. They are uh, uh, places that you have to work around. They they are a process issue that we have to contend with. There's I no question. That. That's, just wanted to know how far I inculcated the place system. So it's 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 workable, right? My answer has to be yes. Yes. Very good. It gave it a great deal of thought. So. Thank you, and I appreciate that. And thanks all of you for your testimony today. It's been very gratifying to see this thing work and you people that make it work. Thank you, sir. We thank you. Thank you, madam. Chair. Thank you, Mr. You've Chairman. Done a beautiful job. Man. Thank you. Um, I want to take care of a little bit of housekeeping before I begin my questions. Um, I would like to, without objection, enter the statement of Mayor de Galdos. Uh, testimony into the record. He was not able to make it today, so without objection, so ordered. Um, Ms. Wade, let me ask you, did you see uh, a NEPA statement um, with regards to the prescribed fire that was ignited um, the that resulted in the Sierra Grande fire? There is a process associated with a prescribed fire plan, which is a consultative process. Uh, I believe in this case it was not comprehensive enough. Uh, clearly has been demonstrated that it was not because people did not feel like they were as involved with that process as they should have been. And um, it was not a specific NEPA process. It was a consultative process. There is a, it, there is a checkoff. Uh, that we go through that relates to um, environment, possible environmental effects. Ms. Wade, I think it's very sobering that both, of the gov both the governor and the state forester as well as community leaders and officials had no idea that this fire was going to be set. Um, I, I would think that if there was a cry from NEPA um, with regards to understanding the ramifications, economic and environmental ramifications of agency actions, it would be actions such as this. Could, could I respond? Well, let, let me ask Sorry. you. In the future, will you demand from your people for every prescribed fire, the full NEPA process, con consultation doesn't, just doesn't do it. Community leaders need to be involved. The state needs to be involved, not just talking within the family of agencies, but I'm asking you to employ the full NEPA process. Will you do that? We will employ the process that's necessary to get everybody involved. That's not what I'm asking. Well, I, I think, though, we're talking about two different things. There is a, there is a NEPA process associated with the, pre, with the prescribed fire program that goes on in the parks, and that does involve all of these people. But then when we get down to the specific plan, an individual plan, we did not do an adequate job of consulting with everybody that we should have, and we will in the future. One of the things we are doing right now in the state of Colorado is developing a pr process and procedures with the governor's staff that assures that everybody in state government that needs to know what's going on uh, knows. I believe that the air quality people in the state government were advised, but we, we were not um, we were not ever told of other people that we needed to advise in state government, and we didn't ask. I guess you know, Miss Wade, need to do that. you will never again have to face uh, a congressional committee as concerned as we are and peppering you with these kinds of questions, if you will make sure you'll follow the law. Now, you're answering a question I didn't ask. My question to you is, in the future, will you employ the full NEPA process, which by statutory mandate requires that you pull in all county officials and the public? Will you do that? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. Towns, recently the director of fire and aviation, Les Rosencrantz, sent a letter to the acting director of the BLM stating that the president's budget for, uh, for firefighting and preparedness was so low as to threaten not only the ability of federal agencies to adequately fight fires, but to also threaten the safety and well-being of the firefighters themselves. I would like to submit that letter uh, into the record without objection. No, sir. Um, and 
And interestingly and sadly, uh, he also stated uh, sent in a similar letter in 1996, he, he sent this 1996 letter to Mike Dombeck, who was then acting director of the BLM. He received the same reply from uh, Mr. Dombeck as he had before, and that was absolutely no reply to his prophetic concerns that hit the front page of USA Today. These prophetic letters demonstrate an administration in denial and so bureaucratic as to disregard their own lead people. Now, my question to you, Ms. Towns, is how do you respond to the claims made in these two letters that the administration was not adequately training, equipping, and staffing for fighting wildfires? How do you respond to that? First of all, Madam Chairman, I have not seen the letter, and so I wouldn't attempt to respond. Um, I don't uh, know uh, what was asked of Mr. Dombeck or whatnot, but in terms of my own observations of our own staff, are we ready to respond to fire? Yes, we are to the, to the extent that we have the folks to do that, and I've listed for you the things that we have undertaken to try to increase that staff. and. Um, um, that's all that I can speak to. Well, I, uh, I did clearly state what was in the letter, but um, I want to ask you the same question that I asked Ms. Wade. Um, are the full NEPA process is being employed by you prior to setting prescribed fires in the forest? forest? Yes, they are, and yes, we will continue. We complete NEPA on every burn. The state is notified of every de burn. The Department of Environmental Quality is notified, and so it's very possible that that did not get to Mr. Martinez, Mar Martinez in the previous discussion, but I'm answering your question. Yes, we do, and yes, we will. I'm asking for a full NEPA process, not just an environmental assessment. I'm asking for the full NEPA process, including public notification. That is not being done. Um, An environmental assessment is part of full, it's one of the stages of the full NEPA process. Only when in your uh, best judgment, there will be, abs the, the pro project will be benign. Now anytime you set a prescribed burn, this project is not benign. And when you in the Forest Service and various other land management agencies ask for a full NEPA process, on renewing grazing permits, it seems to me that you ought to employ the same standards to your own agency. Will you do that? Madam Chairman, I would not wish to make that commitment. Let me say to you that we are doing NEPA as required by law, and we will continue to do that. Uh, the law states that an environmental assessment may be employed if the ramifications from those decisions right. are totally And benign. then that is self activating to move it to the next step. So, so yes, it is employed. Um, Ms. Towns, you didn't answer my question. I'm very unhappy about that. Because yes. I do believe that a Let full NEPA process must be employed so the citizens who are impacted by your decisions in your office are made aware of what's going on. Let me try to answer your question again. The answer is that we employ full NEPA now. We employ full NEPA in, re in, in response I, to the I don't law. mean to be rude, Once but let me say you are not employing full NEPA when you employ only the EA, and you and I both know that. No, I don't know that, Madam Chair. I'm sorry then, maybe you should get another job no. if you don't understand that. Full NEPA, Madam Chairman, at the environmental assessment, there are natural triggers bent into the, built into that that then take it to the next process. Thank you, Ms. Towns. Ms. Wade, the GAO showed us in graphic detail some of the mistakes that were made in the Sierra Grande fire. Uh, one of these was not allowing a bulldozer to be used because their use was not, cons the use of the bulldozer was not consistent with the ecological management objectives of the park. This policy was obviously misguided in, in the cases of wildfire control and was admitted to be a mistake, but did the Park Service change this policy? Are you going to, in the future, allow for um, mechanical uh, means to prevent the spread of wildfire? 
I asked the question of my folks, um, what is happening in terms of the use of bulldozers? And um, uh, it, it's clear that we do use bulldozers when it's an appropriate tool. And um, I know that for a fact, based on um, the last few weeks' experience in Mesa Verde. Uh, we've successfully used bulldozers there uh, and other mechanical uh, reduction to save uh, very priceless cultural resources and uh, all of the development in Mesa Verde. Um, in the case, uh, and, I, and I've read the report, and I've asked the superintendent, and this is what he says. Uh, bulldozers were authorized for use during the Cerro Grande fire and actually used to put in a small amount of fire line. Their use would not have made any difference. In fact, the fire escaped by being blown across Highway 4 twice, equivalent to two or three width dozer line each time. The dozer line would not have helped. It was the unexpected, unforecasted high wind that caused the fire to escape. And in his opinion, no dozer could have stopped that. What about the tankers that, um, that uh, Chairman <coughs> Steen asked about? We use tankers on fires. In fact, we've, uh, we use But the retardant a, apparently, would, they didn't want to use it in a prescribed You know, I've not heard that from anyone. Okay. And um, I, I believe it, when they called for retardant, the fire was well out of the park and it was used. That's as best I know about it. Ms. Wade, I want to enter for the record an article that appeared in the uh, Colorado Springs Gazette newspaper, uh, uh, an edit, uh, article written by a Jeremy Meyer who stated that in the Mesa Verde fire, uh, or, or the Bircher fire in, in the Mesa Verde National Park, which destroyed 23,000 acres, uh, Randy Smith, as supervisor with the Montezuma County Road Department, was working with the Man Coast Fire Department on July 21st, digging a line around the wildland fire that began when lightning hit in a farmer's field. Uh, he had about 100 yards to go to surround that fire, and, and that was burning through oak, oak brush toward the archaeologically rich park. But he needed to plow through the park's boundary and was stopped by a ranger who told his supervisor that it was against policy to run a bulldozer in the park. And so instead, we lost 23,000 acres. Um, that's similar to some of the decisions that are being made all over uh, Ms. Wade. Uh, up in northern Idaho, they weren't allowed to take water out of a river to stop a fire in the Clearwater National Forest because they didn't want to scoop up fish. Uh, and drop them on the fire because some of those fish may be endangered. So we burned up, you know, tens of thousands of acres up there. Do you see the problems that we're well, frustrated I, with? I, I do understand that, and I do have a report um, dated July 26th on this issue, and would be glad to submit it for the record. I would appreciate that thank without you. objection. So thank ordered. you. Well, I want to thank you uh, for your uh, for your testimony. It's been a long, long hearing, and you have sat through a, a lot of testimony. Um, this has been uh, a fairly charged, uh, emotionally charged subject, but you know, sometimes it takes that to, to get us to do the extraordinary, to get us to do that which isn't easy and comfortable, and that's, and that's the trust that we and the Congress and the American people have, uh, have placed in you. And I, uh, I really do uh, look forward to, to, some, to some changes. This is my last year with the committee and my last year with the Congress, but I will, I will be watching what I hope will be more productive and good work that will be coming from the agencies. It's my concern, really, in the future that we free up the, the resource managers in the field, that we give them uh, the necessary tools uh, to do their job and to make decisions. Uh, the buck stops with you. You have to face the Congress, those of you who are working in the field. You have to face members like me who are thoroughly frustrated. But, um, and it's not pleasant for you, it's not pleasant for me, but more unpleasant is the ramification of indecision and uh, the, the inappropriate application of resources. But scientists have been telling us for over 20 years that fuel conditions were putting our forests at risk 
And Congress has been working on this issue for 15 years. And ever since I've been chairman, I have been saying that uh, 51 million acres are, are, are now in uh, a state of near collapse. And uh, it, they will burn. It's just a matter of how soon. Now, our appropriation committee hearings in 1993 led to the Forest Service releasing their study titled uh, Western Forest Health Initiative. The recommendations of their report were not implemented even in 1993, their own report, this administration's own report. And since then, the agencies have done more studies but have yet to implement activities on the ground. At my request two years ago, the GAO initiated a study of hazardous fuels treatments on federal lands and last year released their findings uh, that were primarily focused on the fact that despite the overwhelming evidence that fuel treatments were necessary, the Forest Service has yet to develop and implement um, the details of the cohesive strategy and bring it in into the area where our, our supervisors and rangers can get a handle on it and begin implementing it in the field. In response, last year I introduced legislation to allow for increased fuels reduction in the wildland urban interface. In 1995, we passed the, uh, the, the Salvage uh, Fuels Reduction Act, and it was systematically signed into law, and then uh, the land managers uh, were advised not to implement it in the field, and so we're seeing the results of that now. This administra administration testified against my bill, the wildland uh, in, in urban interface, um, bill uh, saying that it was unnecessary. So now, as I stated before, the agency has produced a cohesive strategy, another one, but the administration won't release it. Uh, last week, the president, as I said before, called for yet another study, another study. You will give me a break. We're tired of studies. We want to see healthy forests and healthy communities. I don't give a darn whether the which political party gets the blame or, um, or makes the points in, in some polls. All I care about is that forests are treated and communities are protected. We know enough to act. The problem is we lack the will to act. If $1 billion and 5 uh, million acres doesn't create that will to act, then we are truly in trouble as a country. But I remain optimistic. This is America. When I meet with agency employees on the ground and when I talk with county commissioners and, and uh, other state employees, I find uh, a tremendous knowledge of the problem, uh, an institutional knowledge that is very, very impressive, and an intense desire to do the right thing. It is simply a matter of letting these good people do their jobs, and if we don't, the great fire season of 2000 will be eclipsed by the great fire season of 2003 or 2010 or 2013. I pledge to continue to work hard on this, and I ask that those of you in leadership positions within the agencies uh, work in, with us in this regard. I want to again thank you for your testimony. I want to thank all of you for your good work. I understand your dedication. Someday I want to see you free to do your jobs. You have 10 working days to, uh, to add uh, to your testimony should you wish to. And those of you who want to uh, submit comments to uh, the committee have 10 working days also. I want to thank, uh, I want to thank Mr. Udall for being here. You know, I am impressed by the fact that the Democrat uh, convention is going on in Los Angeles and he is here. Thank you, Mr. Udall. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the esteemed chairman of the uh, Appropriations Committee on uh, Agriculture for joining us today, Mr. Skeen. Thank you very much. And thank you. It's good to be a guest in your, your, uh, in your state, and I look forward to, as a private citizen, being here again. With that, thank you very much, and this hearing is adjourned. Now we get your chili sticks. What? Now we get your chili sticks. Good, good, good. <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. You are welcome. I'm going to touch you.
every night this week, a special look at the global community. See recent discussions on global issues such as peace, security, human rights, technology, and culture. The global community.